Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, joined by Joseph Juba. Yeah, welcome, sir. Elise Favis. Hey. Favis, no one's sure. And then we have Dan Tech. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Here you we can go, ask her. You can <laughs> just <laughs> ask her. I did. Really I did a long time ago. Hansen, you know And years. forgot. Yeah. That's right. Uh, welcome back, Elise. How long has it been? <laughs> what was the last episode you were on? Uh, that's a good question. It's been a month or so. Maybe more. Maybe more. Yeah, Gosh, it's been a I can't while remember since either. The last podcast. Probably Uncharted Four Game Club or something. No, and it was Jojuba, definitely you just, E3 at least. Yeah. Jojuba, you never leave. Yeah. And uh, Dan Tack, it feels like you're always here. Sometimes thanks to the I'm YouTube here. commenters. Yeah. Hey, they're they're <laughs> awesome, by the way. <laughs> God bless each and every one. So we have a hell of a show. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of swaps. We're covering a lot of ground in today's show. Uh, boy, some great questions in the middle. But to kick things off, we're talking about Tacoma. Then Mario versus Rabbids, uh, the Switch game coming mm-hmm. up. And Reeves is going to talk all about his time playing that. Then Slime Rancher. Joe, you're going to yeah, talk about that. I'm excited. Do it. Uh, Reiner is going to weigh in on Fortnite. I know we talked about it a little while ago, but uh, we'll talk about something new there. Dan, you're going to talk about Kingsway, whether oh, yeah. you like it or not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then we might get Kyle in here for a hot minute. And then those great community emails. And then back half of the show, uh, it's an interview uh, with an interesting figure. His name is Brett Duville. Um, not a household name, but by God, he will be after this interview. <laughs> uh, so he was a lead programmer back at LucasArts, working on like Jedi Starfighter and then Republic Commando. Then he was a lead programmer uh, at Bethesda, working on games like Fallout 3, Skyrim, Fallout 4, and then transitioned and worked on Tacoma, which mm. is out this week, which we're going to mm. talk all about. And um, then... And now, who knows? <laughs> now he's going to keep working on smaller <laughs> projects. Had to keep it rolling. Right? There we go. Uh, but uh, yeah, he tells, he, he's seen a lot of the industry. So he has some good stories about like uh, George Lucas's suggestions for Republic Commando, which I w- will live the rest of my life always eager to hear a story about George Lucas offering suggestions on video games. It's yeah. like my favorite thing. <laughs> Joe? There are, some, uh, there are some creepy stories about that. Or not creepy. creepy. Uh, well, one that's a little creepy and others that are just strange. Well, Reiner like, wrote about that one, yeah, like Darth yeah. Icky and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, can you, so when you say he was at LucasArts, you mentioned Republic Commando. Like what, yeah. uh, what, uh, what era, like what kind of games did he work on there? It was a uh, Starfighter, uh, Jedi Starfighter, Republic Commando. Uh, then he also did a little bit of work on galaxies and stuff like that. So okay. kind of that, that time frame. Um, he talks about uh, working on Skyrim, what Todd Howard's like to work with, stuff like that. Uh, he talks about like, Recently, fans have been trying to piece together what this Civil War code is within Skyrim. So he talks about like what that was all about, why they decided to emphasize basically dragons more than the concept of like Skyrim erupting into this massive civil war at a mm-hmm. certain point. Um, and he also does a game club, that, which I think we've mentioned on this podcast before with Tim Longo, who was the original creative director for the Tomb Raider reboot, uh, directed uh, Republic Commando, and then it was the director of Halo 5. But him and Tim Longo break down an absurd amount of games. So if you miss Game Club from Game Informer, <laughs> which it'll come back at some point, uh, you can check out Dev Game Club. Uh, so we talk about that podcast and what he's learned from it and stuff. So anyways, stay cool. tuned for that interview. It's a good time. Uh, but for now, Tacoma from Fulbright. Yeah, I, I give it an 8.25. There we go. Tacoma uh, from Fulbright, everybody. The I think end. we're all pretty on the same page that we like it. Oh, yes, no. interesting. No. No? Oh, I, okay. I, I had a, a, you know, I'd say, I'd, I'm not on the like side, but I'm, I'm not on the like the... Man, it's terrible. Don't play it. But I, it was. We could, we'll talk about this later. I wanted to right, like right. let you say the cool stuff first. But um, well, I think before we even get to the cool stuff, I am going to be strict on a no spoiler policy. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That is all this game is. And Definitely. so let's let's yeah, well, very we'll much air on, on the side of nothing. Of that. Um, Thank you, Ben. You're welcome. But yeah, basically, this is Fulbright's next game. The makers have gone home. Yeah. Um. So it's probably the most different thing they could have done in, in thematically anyway i yeah. mean you you're still uh, exploring a kind of like abandoned space but yeah it takes place in space this time uh you are going to retrieve an ai there and you follow you, you're basically uncovering this mystery of what happened to this this uh, space crew mm-hmm. that, that went missing for the first um, time it's an abandoned space station I have your mind around that ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, much like on home i right, mean a core like, of the game is reading a lot uh, and learning a bit about these people's personalities through reading it's, and listening to them this time around. So there's one augmented thing, reality. That's right. One thing that I thought was really interesting. About, so, so you mentioned before, like, oh, it's an abandoned space station. What could mm-hmm. have happened? And it's one of the things that I actually found kind of interesting about this is that um, when we first went to go see this game for the cover story, like two years ago, yeah, Kim and Wade and I went mm-hmm. and, um, that that was kind of the story hook at the time was like, okay, 
you're here on this station. You don't know what happened to the crew. And like, there's a mystery to figure out there. And I think this adheres to no spoilers because this is like the opening minutes of the game. Sure. You are approaching the space station Tacoma and you're told right off the bat, like, all right, you're approaching space station Tacoma. What's happened to the crew? They've been evacuated. They're not here. Mm -hmm. Okay, go. Yeah. So I like, I think it's interesting that if you think this is, if you think this is the kind of game, and that's not to say that there aren't other things to figure out and piece together and stuff. But like, if you think that the hook of this game is, you show up on an abandoned space station. What happened to the crew? It's your job to find. You know, it's, it, it's you, gotta, you it's know gotta, the end result. You, you do. I don't feel like you totally I, do, though. Yeah, I don't feel like you do either. I, and this is tough to talk about without spoilers. I feel like you're told something, but that you have a. Um, it's more complicated than you think. I mean, the, yeah. the narrator is not trustworthy necessarily. The, there's an that's element it, of doubt. It. There's yeah. an element of doubt to it for sure. But like, I I feel like the game does not dangle this in front of you as this big mystery of like. What happened to the crew? It's more just I learning mean, the personality of the crew. Yeah, it is anyway. It is less about that and more about, like, the relationships between them and how they face this, like, impending doom. Yeah. Um, which I think is, is well done for the most part. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what was the most interesting part of the game for you, Elise? I really enjoyed um, the, the medic character, Sarah. Oh, sure. I think sure. she was probably my favorite. Well, her and Nat were, were two of my favorites. But She I gets a lot really, of AR screen time. Yeah, yeah, I really liked Sarah and like her conversations with Odin, the, the station AI guy. Um, just because like, it's just really interesting to see like how self-aware is he and like, and talking about like, oh, I've never met any other AIs before and, yeah. you know, trying to... That's into the nature those. of AI a little bit. I liked that a yeah. lot. I mean, hmm. I think the most novel thing about this game is how you're interacting with the crew. Uh, so it's a bizarre system where it memorized where these characters were, they're being traced and whatnot, and it's projecting a hologram. So they right. all look like... Blobs. Uh, <laughs> like the early iPhone, iPod commercial silhouettes. <laughs> uh, all like brightly colored silhouettes. Which is super smart to give everybody their distinct color. And yes. they also have like a logo of their like, job on I'm their the back. I'm the engineer. I'm the medic. It, it yeah. would have been so easy to make this just a mush of people. But it's so I, nice and distinct to be like, okay, the orange lady. I remember how this oh goes. Oh, no, for sure. And I think, honestly, the most unique thing about Tacoma isn't necessarily where it's taking place or its story. It's how it tells its story. Yes. Um, like the fact that you have that timer at the bottom of the screen that you can rewind and pause and like fast forward simulations, follow different holograms to different parts of the ship is like very amazing and fascinating. And it's, it's one of those things like, oh, this is such a good idea. I don't know what other game setting would allow for an idea this right. efficient for storytelling. Yeah. And it is. Yes. So it's like within the space station, there's pockets uh, where you can rewind and fast forward through mm -hmm. this little sequence to see where everybody is. And then it largely, the game uh, is just an immersive experience, uh, like an immersive theater experience, That's I should exactly say, right? exactly what it yeah. is. It's yeah. like interactive theater. You're like a fly on the wall while all these different things are happening. And, you know, like say there's a group talking and then one of them goes off and has a panic attack or something. You can go and... And, and see that unfold. I, I made Elise take the reference out of a first draft of her review, but she mentioned Sleep No More. Yeah. Yes, um, which, which is like a, a Macbeth, take on Macbeth, mm -hmm. interactive theater performance. Yeah. 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 We, uh, we talked about immersive theater, I think, in actually the first episode of the rebooted podcast, Tim and I did quite a bit because they mm -hmm. had some in Minneapolis and Cork and I fell in love. Uh, we saw Drown Man uh, from the Sleep No More uh, producers. Punch Drunk, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And there's even a Sleep No More reference in one of the emails within Tacoma. Uh, so it's very obvious that they're tipping their captors. <laughs> yeah. Like, we know yeah. what this is. Oh, they yeah. do. Uh, which, uh, it's an awesome idea do you feel like then it boils down too much into I'm just going to sit here and listening, listen to these people talk? It feels almost like a less active investigation than Gone Home in some ways. Um, I don't know. I mean, you're still moving around and inhabiting a space, right? Yeah. While you follow those different holograms, holograms and stuff. I guess I it would have been nice like to have more interactivity with some things. Um, like I liked how there were some locked compartments and stuff where you'd have to go and find the keys and stuff and there's you know little fun little things like playing basketball and the pool stuff uh, i think i would have liked to have more of that maybe yeah. um i did like those little tidbits and the attention to detail is crazy yeah for sure it, there's certainly moments of a lot of the game was oh this is a really brilliant way to convey this story and then the other part of it is 
it kind of just feels like I'm well, just sitting are, here listening to this uh, this play going on, standing around uh, for, for the most part and just watching something unfold around you. But um, I don't know. I appreciated it. I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah, and th- this is something I want I want to talk about real quick, like uh-huh. because I think I'm thinking about like why didn't I like this game as much as I liked. You know, this genre I normally don't like at all anyway, right? But don't like, say the name of the genre or Joe's not going head to, will I don't want to get into that conversation. <laughs> uh-huh. Games like this, okay? Yes. Uh-huh. Gone um, Home Likes. So I really liked Edith Finch, right? Yeah. And I started wondering, like, you know, what did that do for me that this didn't? And it was um I guess just sort of how it interacts with you. I felt like such more of a passive player here. Even even trying to get into the lurks. I, I really liked how you could rewind stuff and that was the, like one of the only things I liked. But like really pulling those threads, but at the same time I felt like because it is, it's on rails, right? You are, you are stuck. You have to go to this place, then this place, then that place. There's really no way to break that. On uh, rails is a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. I mean, there's, really, you got to go to. It's really got to do one zone to go to another zone. It's a pretty there's, linear progression. Yeah, it's but within the zone, I mean, it's you, like okay, here's a space fr- explorer. You have it. freedom in those zones. Yeah, you, you do, but it's still A to B to C to D, right? There are there's like little things that you can find I in think, each one if you if you yes. pull the thread and get the codes and stuff like that. To, it's shaped like a beaded necklace. Mm. I, no, I think it's just like a, a straight line. But, okay, I, I, you know, that's just my interpretation of it. And, and I just felt there was, there was very little interactivity. Like, you know, there you could theoretically, I don't know why you do this, but you could actually, you know, in the segments, just attach your thing and go to sleep. And you wake up and that area would be done, right? Oh, is that right? I, I was still confused about what was triggering the progress. Now, I, um, I, I can't say for sure, but I watched, like, I tested it for, for like 10 minutes and the meter kept going. So I don't know if that there's a there's a hard stop on that and you have to go look at the stories or I think it's one of those games where you get as much out of it as you put into it. For sure. Which, I mean I think it's fine. And I, I rushed through it. I was one of those things where I accidentally saw credits roll. I was like, Oh, I shouldn't have seen this yet. I'm not fully understanding well, what's going on. Uh, you, you had to know you were going for credits at that point. I wasn't hundred <laughs> percent sure. I thought there might be something. Um, not that the ending is abrupt out of nowhere. Like I should have thought that. But anyways, I think it is one of those games, at least is right, like if you're going to buy this game and play it, scour it. Like, take the time to understand if you're interested in it, at least, like, every nook and cranny, really yeah. savor it, because that's I mean, the experience. Yeah, and I think, Elise and I, I think it took us about five hours, you said? Yeah. And I, I feel Being like I was thorough, pretty thorough. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, like, the, the Edith Finch is, like, different different interactions you'd have in each thing, even though that's linear as well. But each vignette was very different and had a different interaction for the player to do. Yeah. yeah. I, I felt in this case it was, I didn't have that going on. I I think Edith Finch is like really good at giving that variety and like each sequence there felt so different from the other. Whereas this is the same mechanic through the whole game, right? Yeah. Um, Which is, is, I don't think is a bad thing, but they're different. Yeah. I mean, there's still different things that you're investigating. I mean, on the silhouettes then has the interesting thing where it'll have like a little key spot. Like, okay, you in this area, if you click on it, then you can maybe read their emails, read their texts. There's different things to read to some degree. It's not it just is, purely watching these it, people talk. Yeah. I mean, it's very voyeuristic for sure. But yeah, um, yeah you, you can see all those conversations and they basically had no privacy. But I think that's the key. And this and this goes back to what I was saying earlier is that like like I, voyeuristic is a good word for it. But you keep saying about like investigating. And I just did not get an yeah. investigative feel. From Investigate their personalities. Yeah. I mean, so like really what this game is, the, narr- the narrative you're exploring is who these characters are, what their relationships were, what they were doing on this station. And that's all sort of delivered through you to you through this mechanism of like, what were they doing in the final moment? Like, you know, what, what was happening on that space station before they, you know, whatever happened. So, right. Right. Uh, were you, uh, were you moved by the stories, Joe? I mean, I, I, I liked the characters. I wouldn't say that there was like, I don't think it's one of those stories that's going to keep you on the edge of your seat. Like, it's just, it's it's more mundane, but, like, still engaging, you know? Okay. It's, 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 it's slow-paced, but it's engaging. Can I? You know, it's about, it's a, it's a character-driven story. Yeah. 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 Go for it, Joe. I don't feel like it's, like, it's, it's a character interaction story. It, to me, it's like, character, and again, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed this. So, I don't, like, I don't mean for these to, like, sound, sound like complaints, but it really, like I think of character driven and I feel like I did not have that <clears throat> that sort of drive to like, oh, I really want to find out about these people. Like I, I liked the voyeuristic element mm-hmm. of it and like piecing all of that together. Being a creeper is great. But I didn't feel <laughs> I didn't feel like I was being propelled through this game, you know, by the personalities or or anything. I've, I felt like I and which, again, 
I thought that this is an interesting way to tell a story about, yeah. about it's like, hey, you're on the space station, wander around, piece things together, and when you're ready, you go. And that's like that's sort of. I mean, I was still wondering the whole time, like, okay, so what happened to them, and what was the final result? Hmm. Like, I wanted that to be wrapped up personally. Yeah, you went on. Uh, right. You went on the cover story years ago. Yeah, uh, and you were talking in the office at least, just like you were struck by how different the game is now. Oh yeah, super different. Yeah, I mean, and I went back and looked at some of the videos, and I'm like, oh, that's right. There's the whole like weird vertical chamber where you're like launching yourself. It seemed much more. Uh, I don't know what the best word. A little more. Uh, physics based a little more exploration focused yeah. in that original version of the game the version yeah the version we saw is like there were i wouldn't call them necessarily puzzles but it like like it wasn't just you walk into a room and the narrative starts playing yeah it was a, more like you had to interact with the environment in different ways to tr to trigger those things and there was like an anti-gravity boot that you would like you'd like jump from the floor to the ceiling to, yeah. and like go over go in a little access way the whole premise was different too because like as it is right now, Tacoma is like <clears throat> some sort of like commercial shipping facility or something. Mm -hmm. But in the version, like when we saw the game years ago, the concept behind it was like Tacoma was sort of like a way station for tourists that were going to the moon. So the staff that was there wasn't like a commercial shipping staff. Yeah. They were just sort of like the maintenance staff of the station that was sort of keeping it running while these tourists sort of came in and out. That's right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, just like little, little things like that, that I mean, I, I think ultimately Fulbright found a good way to focus, to focus a story and really, like, I mean, like Elise was saying, really make it about the characters. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of remove some of the extraneous stuff from the edges of the story and the setting that, that they weren't really able to like fully explore or realize. And I think they do a good job too of making it about the characters and making the space station feel lived in. Even yeah. if it just comes down to like yeah. handwritten notes. Mm -hmm. Just the, uh, I mean, like, hey, the, head over this way for this thing. Sex you know? toys. The amount of exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm hinting at. Thank you for getting beaten around the bush there, Joe. Especially like I thought it was really cool how when you go into like someone's personal quarters, you will see this kind of like fuzzy, very old hologram from them from like six months ago. And yeah. you can just I, I don't know why I really like that detail of like what they do uh, on their own and like in their daily lives. And it just, yeah, it you, just you gives hinted a very lived in sense. Yeah, for sure. And you hinted at it earlier, but I think the most striking part is just that immersive theater experience again. I think so. But, I, oh, I, but I was going to say like that idea of like following a character and getting to see them kind of like by themselves, like even psyching themselves up sometimes and then right. going out and interacting with other people and like right. if you're a little bit creeper and just like rewind it and play that again like also, it is interesting um, I also thought it was like everything feels kind of connected like people will regroup or like they'll hear something going on in another room like I don't know and then you can like oh like what happened in that room and then you can go and play that out for I sure very yeah. much like that a lot yeah it's not like a bunch of stories radiating out from one hub it's a lot of no, like lines intersecting and exactly yeah, exactly cool. yes. I remembered what I was going to say before that, oh please that. um and this is again more towards like the mystery or being propelled by the game it's yeah like, can I can I spoil gone home or just a oh little yeah, bit yeah, of yeah. It? okay so there's, I just remember in Gone Home, there's just the, the sinking feeling of dread I had when I was about to go into that attic. Yeah. And be like, I don't know what I'm going to find, but I think my sister committed suicide up there. Yeah. You know, like, like, like th that was a very affecting moment for me in Gone Home and like what tied that whole experience together for me. And like, I don't think Tacoma has a moment like that. And again, no. I don't necessarily mean to level that as some I huge think, criticism but for people who played um, gone home and are expecting something like that it's a little bit more of like yeah like a voyeuristic a little more relaxed engage at will sort of experience mundane it's, in space it's a it's a less dramatic story that's weird because the I topics mean, it's dealing with they it sounds it, it yeah i don't know um because it it, it 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 is about unraveling that mystery right but you are really focusing on the relationships and you are focusing about how they deal with, you know, their impending death and, and things like that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to put it exactly. Dan, how do you feel like it compares to Gone Home? You know, like I said, I, I, I didn't like Gone Home either. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's why I was so <laughs> blown away by, you know, I hate to bring it up again, but Edith Finch was one of the, the games in the genre that really caught me and said, you know, I'm going to keep giving these games a try because yeah. I really liked that experience. Uh, this one, I don't know. Maybe I am just an emotionless, like horrible person. Oh God, I've been saying that for so long. I know. Finally. Yeah. But I, I was not connecting with any of the character stories particularly. I just thought it was 
I, I'd like, you know, here's your personal effects. Okay, neat. What, what, I, I just, I need a motivation, right? I need to, so I you mean, were the AI walking doing a through thing. this environment. I do yeah. think the story wraps up in a very satisfying way. That's yeah. All, that's mm-hmm. all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to, oh, man, I wish we, we'll talk about the story. Were you moved by the end? <laughs> Not, in fact, I liked the thing that happened before the end. That was the only part of the thing where I really like, was like, ooh, that's, <laughs> that's something. Something's so happening here. If I, I, had a I time, like happening. I want a time lapse of your face, Dan, while playing this game. Because I imagine it's just it was just a, a blank, just stare an Easter for, Island head <laughs> for, for like for like for like two hours. It yeah. was basically like yeah, a right. slightly raised eyebrow near the I don't end. Know. I think now that's that, that, I, mean, I think Tacoma's for a certain type of person. Sure. I think I'm. I've always liked slow stories about people, so like it was engaging to me. You know. Yeah. Eight two five. Eight two five. What didn't you like about it? Um, I guess, I mean, I think they could have done a bit of a better job. I think Joe brings this up about how all those threads go into the mystery. Okay. You know, I think that could have been handled better. Um, I like how it wrapped up, but it does feel a little hasty, I guess. Hmm. Um, what else? Uh, I... And I think I brought this up before. More interactivity, I think, would have been would have been cool. Um, Pool's not enough. Yeah. yeah. So I think those were the the two major things for me. I think everything else I I liked a lot. Yeah. So. And I feel like they do a lot with the with the sort of like story situations they have, like the the sequences that you're able to like rewind and fast forward through yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I didn't count, but like there aren't a ton of those. Yeah. So again, like I think they do a good job telling the story with. I think with I, what they I have, but I kind of wanted I kind of wanted some more, more of those. Right. Hmm. Yeah. I think I think I I finished the game being like I want to know more about these people and like m- where you know what ha- what happens and yeah that was one of the, that was one of the other things yes. I noticed like there's so much stuff you can just like pick up but all of it is I mean not all of it the stuff that develops the characters because they have them those are those have purpose mm-hmm. but like there's just so much junk that you can just pick up and play with that has. No meaning whatsoever. Well, it's I hear you, but what's the other option there? Make it so you can't pick up anything except for the no, ones I, that have emotional. I'm merely I saying, like, that you could pick up most things and, I, and <laughs> examine them. I don't know. I like seeing the, some of the more static uh, items were actually way more, way more interesting to me than, than the stuff that you know, pick up a cup of noodles and throw it at the wall, you know, or a, or a cup, a mug, <sighs> you know. Um, I don't know stuff like the the food supply, like mm-hmm. gauges. Those mm-hmm. those were more compelling to me than. Than the myriad of objects just all over the place that you could just pick up and fling around. I don't. I just. Eh, I don't we, know. We did see this in Gone Home too. Fulbright is really good at making fake, fake products. I kind of like mm. that. Though, but <laughs> but yeah. even beyond that, they're also really good at tying into real objects. Like early on, they reference Amazon uh, mm-hmm. in uh-huh. some way. Like they they're smart about making it connected enough to the real world, yeah. and it's a pretty yeah. cool setting for the year what twenty eighty eight, I think. And like Carnival Cruise Lines has become this like inter this like inter- yes. stellar space tourism powerhouse or something. Yeah, of course. I, didn't, yeah, I sure. didn't have any problem like suspending disbelief for that at all. Like that, you felt like you were truly there, Dan. No, I didn't feel like I was truly there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the story, you know, it, it's okay. You know, I mean, I mean like it Tacoma makes sense. Transported Dan to I space. I think I think there are some <laughs> things I could have done a bit better with the story. Well, there we go. Yeah. Tacoma gone homa. It's all out there. <laughs> I'm curious what people think about it. I'm curious what kind of splash it'll make compared yeah. to Gone Home. Um, yeah. I think it's tough to top Gone Home. I don't. It's th- that's just a difficult comparison to make. I think. Yeah. You know, like it's not going to make that same splash, but especially it, yeah, it does, especially it does, it, does, it does its own cool stuff. You're talking about Gone Home as basically a game that like kind like, of like changed popularized it this whole kind of experience. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like. It's not. Yeah, I'm not going to say it. No, we're not going <laughs> that's to. So that's, funny. It's to so me. dumb if we do. I don't, there's no point it's to so, talk about that every episode. I know, but it's just funny how we're tap dancing around saying the name of a it. of a genre. Okay, all right. It's not the name of a genre. I think it's you a bad write, like, name. Like an op-ed about this. Uh, uh, and the name like... the name of the genre is "Gone Home Like Experience." Then, uh, I like I call them narrative driven experiences. Okay, all right. Things Little like stories. Uh, Elise, <laughs> thank you so much. We're gonna get you back right. for emails if you're down for that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for now, do you want to just clap once for me? Ben Reeves, everybody. Hey. hey Welcome, sir. Hey, look at this guy. Look at me. Uh, we have you here as our Mario Rabbids expert, which is probably something you did That's not right. know you are going to be a year ago. <laughs> no. <laughs> Three months ago, probably. <laughs> uh, so you played Mario plus Red Rabbids plus equal, Rad Rabbids. equals Kingdom Battle. That'd be a better name. But yeah, I did. I got a chance to go out and play like a good three hours of the game. Where'd so. you go? Uh to the netherworld yeah that's where they got it <laughs> stored 
<laughs> yeah, I was in, uh, otherwise known as San Francisco. Oh, that's yeah. right. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, so I played the early section of the game, and they showed us a whole new area, which is like the third world. Okay. Which is fairly late into the game, because there's only four overworlds. But this one is uh, ghost-themed, so oh. very haunted house, spooky. Red, are there booze? booze? Yep. Oh, are they on the overworld, and when they when you look away from them, will they go after you? Uh, you know what? I did not see that, so I think they blew it there. Fly. Really I did because I asked him that exact same <laughs> question. They booted there, I should say. But yeah, they they do encounter. You will encounter them in battles, and they actually are not strictly enemies. They're more of kind of like an environmental effect. So what? they'll port around a, a an environment and like grab your dude, and then teleport him to another area. How so does really that are. sounds aggravating if you're trying to <laughs> execute some sort of strategy. Have you ever dealt with ghosts? They're constantly yeah. aggravating, Joe. That's the <laughs> defining characteristics of a ghost. Uh, ghosts I think do. that's more of a poltergeist than a ghost. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's good. You should email Nintendo. Yeah. So, Nintendo Reeves, help me out. In a broad sense here, uh, game was uh, leaked. Everybody said, boo! <laughs> then in the E3, everybody said, oh! <laughs> and now, after spending even more time with it, what's your voice saying? <laughs> <laughs> so that's lower than uh, E3? That, that's higher. No, I was, I was trying to go higher. Just, it's continuing to climb? I have no <laughs> sense of uh, audio. Yeah, it's still... Uh, I think people didn't know what the game was when it leaked, so they mm-hmm. were just like, rabbits. I, I don't think people like rabbits to begin with, and the idea of tainting Mario with those rabbits. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you grow up? <laughs> so, on about Mario's tank. So anyway... <laughs> you want a wet nap for that? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway... Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. So people didn't like it, the leak, but... <laughs> Hang on. Joe's right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, we're scattered. Okay, we got it. We got it. People didn't like the leak. All right, we're good. We're I good. think this has been Hanson's fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say. Uh, I think we need a host. A new host. <laughs> I think I'll just go out and say it. Uh-huh. But yeah, so when the game was actually shown at E3, I think people were like, oh, actually, this doesn't look too bad. And rightly so, like, because it doesn't look too bad. Like, it, it's a cool XCOM. I'm just trying to figure on... out, are you continuing to dig into the game and you're continuing to be impressed? Or it's like, oh, it's about what people think it was at E3. Uh, I, Yeah, I would say it's probably about what people think it was at E3. I think some people thought that it's like, well, it's Mario Rabbit. It's going to be like a dumb kid game version of XCOM. Yeah. And, and it's easier than XCOM, but that's not hard to make an easy <laughs> game that's uh, easier than XCOM. But I will say it's it's more complex than I think I even anticipated it would be. What kind of stuff? Well, it, it's all very movement-based, too, which is a new feel for a strategy game. Because usually you have, you know, you find your cover, and the enemy has their cover, and you're just, like, shooting back and forth at each other. Maybe you're trying to strafe around them um, and throw missiles at them or something. But this game is all very movement-based. So you jump off your dudes. Uh, you can run and attack an enemy. And the rabbits, especially, they can like string attack enemies. So they'll like run and physically attack an enemy, maybe do three attacks with three different enemies and then find cover. And then they still get to attack with their guns. Huh. Hmm. So uh, it's a lot of like jumping off of your friends and then jumping off of enemies and lining up your attacks before you actually do your full on attack with your weapons. And they all combo together. So it's like a lot of combo strategy, which I thought was pretty fun, actually. Huh. So I, I have a question about this. And that's like, like, that sounds that sounds fun, but that also sounds like stuff that we sort of knew about it coming out of E3. Yeah. Like, can you can you say anything specific about what you learned with your time with the game that felt like like new or surprising beyond you know the time that we got with it in June? I mean, in terms of surprising, I don't think there's anything totally surprising because the surprising stuff happened at E3. It's like, oh, this game looks good. Mario great. has a gun. Yeah, Mario yeah, has a forget gun. Forget the guns. Did you know that there are duck grenades in this game? What are you talking about? What? That's surprising. Duck- is that surprising? Oh, wait, are these grenades made of ducks or grenades engineered specifically to kill ducks? It is duck hunting. One in the Reeves same. Reese is going to tell you all about the duck. Oh, they're okay. basically rubber ducky looking bombs. And oh, okay. a couple of different characters have those. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's not as cool as when I describe it, I bet. But. Wait, but then they explode <laughs> with like fiery inferno yeah, explosions. Have, there's like a solid snake one too, right? Like. A solid s- oh, there's one that looks like Solid Snake. He's there's, not like labeled. Splinter Cell one or whatever, right? <laughs> he's not like labeled the Solid <laughs> Snake duck. I, he's Splinter Cell duck. Yeah, that's what he looks like. Come yes. on, that's what he yes. is. <laughs> yeah, that's what he is. I mean, maybe he's <laughs> Sam Spade. That'd be a good name for him. And he explodes? <laughs> and he, Yeah, so it's a it's a grenade. It's okay. just in a weapon that the guy... I didn't know had. if it was like a flower grenade. I don't know how cutesy this okay, game's trying this to be. These, the cl- they all have secondary weapons. So some of them get the grenades and some of them get like these hammers. You can use them to smack guys and slow them down with honey. Okay, so honey is like the... Uh, Cute. 
the slow liquid in this game. Jazz so you, yeah, it. exactly. And exactly. there's a bunch of different effects. There's like ones that make characters bounce all over the screen. So you hit them and like it initiates a bounce effect and they'll like fly off of the map and die okay. instantly, which is actually pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, and there's one that turns them into stone so they can't move. So there's a bunch of different effects for different weapons. I'll be and damned. Then there's also a robot you can like deploy in the battlefield. So Luigi has this little mobile turret that you can send off <laughs> down into the field and then it'll blow up when it makes contact with enemies. Yeah, I don't know if they showed at E3. Tell them about the uh, the time trial sort of thing to get the, the unlocks. Yeah, they mentioned me? that there are a bunch of... When you're not engaged in enemy gunfire, right? There's a bunch of like puzzles, they called it. But at E3, all I saw was like you collecting a bunch of coins. Uh, this time, I actually did get to see a puzzle. So it's like one of those classic light... Uh, mirror puzzles where you're reflecting light across the battlefield. But I will say like the puzzle was somewhat engaging. I was like, I like the puzzle. And then there's also these time trials they will encounter where you're trying to collect coins. Uh-huh. And they mix it up quite a bit. So it's like trying to move this statue from one place to another to open up these doors and collect the coins before I ran out of time. I which yeah, it was pretty engaging. It was a nice Change of pace from the strategy. Very engaging. So Side I, note, yeah. I am done reflecting light beams off mirrors for Here, the rest of my I life. I saw your reaction to that, ever Joe. do that again. Here's like, what better, we need to do. Better not play another Final Fantasy game because you know it's going to have those. I, I mean, would you? are you <laughs> done with like moving blocks down a screen yes! like in Tetris? Yeah. So you'd never no. play Tetris again? No, 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 no. I thought you meant like pushing crates and crap. If you bash Tetris yeah. one more time on this podcast, Reese, will help me, God. You know what we need to do, Joe? I, I ain't no features editor. Okay. We need to make a feature for the site that's just the Hall of Fame video game puzzles and just come up with like, I don't know what it would boil down to, the eight templates of you know, like, these are the puzzles. You should talk to Jeff Cork because I think he's actually written that feature already. Has he really? Yeah. yeah. Like, if, I can't remember if it's like on our, he might have done it when he was like, before, when he was just online only or okay. something. But oh, he's, wow. he has written something about lame video game puzzles. Oh God. Because yeah. you can boil that stuff down and really there's only a couple of key ingredients everyone's working with. Yeah. What would you never get tired of? For puzzles, though. Favorite puzzle? Anything? Honestly, balancing across the log. I don't know. Does that even count as a puzzle? <laughs> I, I probably. think it's all like, about how it's executed. God. Like, of course, like, it, it's moving not a, crates across a field, like, gets bad rap because a lot of games have done it poorly. But if you Just because you like Soul Reaver way, and those things. It, it's not a question of doing something and getting tired of it or, or, like, never getting tired of it. It's Yeah, it's just a question of, like, repetition. That you see something done once and it's interesting the first time then another game does it and then another game does it and suddenly it just becomes part of the like common gaming vocabulary that no one even analyzes they're just like oh we need to do a puzzle here let's do a rotating mirror puzzle okay ta-da the end uh, to answer your question though Reeves I think I think I might be in the minority here I like slidey puzzles like the one where there's the one square missing yeah. you have to move stuff around basically like the stuff that's in Wind Waker yeah if I ever run it when you were five the physical yeah. puzzles I love those as a you. kid and it's the only puzzle if I encounter in a game I'm like alright here, here we go I know exactly what this. the rule set is here I know exactly how to make this work it's just going to take a little bit of time sure. I understand why people are complaining about box, box blocks puzzles but I would just say it's like complaining like oh I never want to play another one again it's like I never want to like shoot an enemy in the face again or like you know it's, uh, my no, you're again. right. It's, it's all like, a, it's, it's, it's all about how the, you do it. What's the difference? It's all, it's all a question of how you approach it and how you make it fun. That's right. But a lot of people, Ooh, a lot of people back just the do blocks. the same one. Uh, Reeves, you also talked to the developers. Uh, anything stand out from talking to those wacky Frenchmen? <laughs> yeah, I was like sweating, like looking at my watch the whole time, afraid I was going to miss my plane. But I was like, <laughs> this this interview, when is this going to get over? And then yeah. I went back and transcribed it. I'm like, oh, this actually isn't a bad interview. So with the interview, job, your first me. question was, when is this going to be over? <laughs> yeah, it's like, can I go? I'm ordering an Uber now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. Yeah. But actually, the interview is up on the site now, and I think it's pretty good. It's uh, with... The producer and the director, the guy who cried on... Was he just screen. crying the entire interview? <laughs> yeah, but I was kicking him in the nuts. So, so I, <laughs> oh, you I, guys. Yeah, uh, no, they talk about the fact that they were inspired by Mario Kart was one of the things that I was like surprised by. Like We were trying to make a Mario Kart game and we whiffed hard. <laughs> just like, oh, I don't know what, yeah, what we did wrong. <laughs> seems absolutely nothing Ship like it. Mario Kart. <laughs> you basically have to keep saying, all right, this is our new racing game, <laughs> Mario plus Rabbids. Kingdom Fun. Battle! <laughs> Just dance. Wait, where are the cars? Miyamoto's very confused. Oh, uh, working with his IP is hard. <laughs> well, but they, they did talk about working with Miyamoto and, like, his feedback. And, like, he was like, just keep making it crazier. Like, show me how crazy you can get. <laughs> show me. That's awesome. That's that's what he said. That's, that's what the guy said he so said. So, is it all just rabbits or is Rayman in there, too? 
I asked him about that, and he said that Rayman's not in the game, and they see those as two very different properties at this point, even though the Rabbids came out of Rayman at mm-hmm. one point. Like, the Rabbids are their own thing, and so they kind of wanted to focus on that, and they they thought if they were going to do a Rayman Mario game, that'd be very different, where they wanted to have the chaos of the Rabbids be kind of a thing okay. that they injected into this game. So I'm like, all right, I'd still like to see <laughs> Rayman. <laughs> Your rebuttals, all right, all right, developer. That's yeah. one way to go. Yeah, that's okay. one answer. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. Reeves, anything else you're dying to get off your chest? Uh, I think that covers it pretty good. I will say, if you're a strategy fan, give this game a shot. You're probably going to like it. And I will say, even if you're not a strategy fan, give it a shot because it's different than most strategy fans. So games. everyone in the world, give it a shot. Everybody, <laughs> well, give it a shot. No, but basically, like, if a game like XCOM seems a little like intimidating for you. If yeah, exactly. If you've been turned off by strategy games in the past, this might be one that appeals to you. It's a terrible racing game. but <laughs> <laughs> I'll be damned. Reeves, you want to give yourself a high five? Yeah, I did great. Hey, Andrew Rayner. Hey. Welcome, sir. Uh, we're going to bang out these segments. This is going to be so much fun. Okay. I hope you like rapid fire game learning. Bang away. <laughs> there we go. Bang a rang. Uh, Joe Juba. Well, this is what I want from you. Okay. Reiner, you sit there politely. Um, Slime Rancher. Yeah. It's been early access forever on Steam. Actually, yeah. not that long. Maybe over a year. Not like a, a year and a half. Now. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, now it's out. Is it out on PS4 in addition to Xbox One? No, it's Xbox One and PC right now. Okay. And it's also the games with gold right. for Xbox. Right. So if you're an Xbox Live subscriber, you can get it for free on Xbox One. So it seems like you like this game a lot. I did. It's, I really did. And the easy pitch for this game would be... So it's hard because I'm always hesitant to do the like, it's like this meets this meets this all in one. But it's kind of a walking sim. Well, so with the understanding that it is more than the sum of its parts, right? Yeah. Like it brings together a lot of things that I really like. It it brings together parts of like the easygoing farming or easygoing ranching of like Viva Pinata. Ooh. Uh, some of the exploration parts remind me of like Minecraft, the sort of idea of being like, okay, I'm far from home in dangerous territory. I got an inventory full of stuff that I want to get back to my base. Yeah. You know? Um, and then there's also kind of an element of like routine that scratches the same itch for me that Stardew Valley did. Yeah, for sure. And it's so, just, if you're a sucker for progression, go for this game. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like one of the things I think it does the best is that, it always gives you interesting things to spend your money on, right? So, like, I think about, like, take a game like The Witcher 3, which when I would get skill points in The Witcher 3, I was always kind of like, eh, an extra, like, 1.2% to critical hit. Eh. Like, my skill points would just accrue and accrue because, like, I wasn't excited to really spend them on anything. Yeah. Witcher 3 is a great game. I really like it. But sure. that, that being said, uh, every time I would get, you know, like, cross a money threshold in uh, Slime Rancher, it would be like, God, what of these like five things do I want? Do I want to upgrade my jetpack? Do I want to build a new corral? Do I need more storage? Do I need another silo? Should I unlock this part of my ranch that I can like maybe get some more plots to deal with? And you know, so it's just like all of these different options and I was excited about all of them. Yeah. So you're walking around. It looks kind of like Team Fortress, uh, mm-hmm. first person sprinting around this environment. Uh, Reiner and I have played a little bit. Tack, I don't know if you played I, I have not, all. but I'm very Man. intrigued based on what I'm hearing <laughs> the now. The best part of the game is you have this vacuum cannon gun thing. Mm-hmm. It's like a power vac 10 billion. That thing That's can right. suck up <laughs> stuff like you wouldn't believe. Like you wouldn't believe. And it's like slime. You're, you're sucking up little slimes like from Dragon Quest, right? Yeah. They're like little teardrop shaped slimes with smiley faces. And you're like... It's, it's very cute. Uh, I, I played about the same last night as I did in early access. And it hasn't changed as much as I thought since last time I checked in on the early access version. And mm-hmm. I, I hit this impasse where it's like, I don't know what I should be doing here. I have two corrals. One of them is overflowing with pink slimes everywhere. And then it's a pain in the ass to pick up their poop, which is the currency in the mm-hmm. game. Is there yeah. some way to filter it out so you can only suck up poop? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested oh, in this question. God. <laughs> so I guess what I'd say is like, like what, what's changed since early access is really just sort of like, like they've been in early access, they've been adding areas over yeah. time and other refinements and stuff like that. So there's more than just that ranch area. You should, you is know. that always home base? Is it the hub or are you yeah. moving your hub? No, no, no. Okay. Your, so your ranch is, is, is your home base. And then, and this is again, I hesitate to make the Minecraft reference too hard because it's not all about like building and stuff like that. It's not procedurally generated. Yeah. But yeah. And it's not procedurally generated, but it does have that element of like, like, going going as far from home as you can or digging well there's no dig go, going far from home to like get valuable resources that you want to that you want to bring but back. you go in caves and stuff like that yeah yeah so there so there are different zones but really 
what the game, like part of what I found really fun about it is it's got a sort of like learn by experience element to it. So it's got this like, like in game encyclopedia that you can sort of reference to give you a baseline of like how, how you should play the game and what you should do. But for me, some of the best parts are just the stories that happen that teach you to like, Oh God, I'm not doing that again. Right. So it's like, like you have one, let's say you have two slimes in the same pen. And you feed them. They're different colors. You have a pink slime and a rock slime. Uh-huh. One's pink, one's blue. Of course. Uh, you feed them each a carrot, and they do their little like plort, which is their what happens when you feed them. You called it poop. I, I don't think it's explicitly poop. It's poop. This, what this the hell is, else would you call it? You feed them, and a thing comes out. And yes, I'm into this, and it's worth it's worth your weight in gold. So, so if a slime eats a different colored plort, it becomes a sort of crossbreed between between the color that it ate and what it is. That works for animals too, Dan, if you ever want to try eating uh, like horses crap. I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably not going to give it a whirl. Okay. <laughs> so part of what make, what makes that interesting though is like in that situation, if both of, if the pink and the blue slime plort and eat each other's plorts, then you have two high, like two crossbreeds that are basically the same kind of slime now. They're both pink blue hybrids, mm. right? But let's say you throw a different kind in there. This is what I tried to do. It's like I, I threw a different kind in there and fed him. Let's say it was a, a yellow one. If an already, if a slime that's already been like crossbred tries to eat a third color of plort, it turns into this monster called the tar that then just like can overrun your range and turn all your slimes into monsters. How do you kill and- them? Uh, you if you can add water to your vacuum gun and that kills them. Because right now all I can do is like suck them up and then walk them someplace no, far no, no, away. No, no, you need you go. need the water upgrade for your gun, and then if you just douse them with some water that you collect, it, it okay. gets rid of them. But but so situations like that are like of the like oh god, I need to be a lot more careful about what slimes I put in which corrals and yeah. what they eat because otherwise, otherwise they can just like turn into this disaster. Which it's never even if it were to wipe out every slime I owned. I probably would have like enough of a reserve of resources that it really isn't hard to go and like catch a few a few slimes and, bring, and you know bring them back. I'm still confused. So you're trying to combine these slimes to get to the rarest slimes so that their poop is worth a fortune. You can cash that in. Like, I, should I have overflowing cages and just catch as many slimes as possible? That's kind. Of, well, no. So usually, for me, the approach that I found that works the best is to have. Uh, I think I keep maybe about eight of a particular eight slimes in a, in a corral usually. And then you can set up machines to the, you can like upgrade the, the corrals to auto feed them and to auto collect the, the plorts. Oh, really? There's the secret ingredient. So where the strategy here comes in is let's say like each slime has a favorite food. So when they eat that, they produce double plorts. I think it's Mexican right food. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Hey. So if you have, <laughs> if you have a uh, so if you have a crossbreed slime that's when you feed it, it automatically plorts out one of each color, right? Uh-huh. But if you feed it its favorite food, it plorts out two of each color. Naturally. So if you want if you want to like maximize your profit, you find the kinds of slimes that are going to produce the most valuable plorts, you crossbreed them, and then you set up the auto feeder to feed it its favorite food and then auto collect the plort. So then when you come back into ranch, you just like gather them up and sell them and make a fortune. It's Joe's favorite type of game because numbers go up. (laughs) (laughs) It's as simple as that. I do really like that. It made me feel like a monster. (laughs) Why? (laughs) These things should be cuddled, given to children, not caged. They are really cute. But then there are some that are kind of, I mean, there's a radioactive one that you can't. He needs uh, to be caged. <laughs> yeah, you got caged out. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's no yeah. doubt. And that's how, so you're not actually breeding slimes and like growing new ones necessarily. You're, they're, the breeds that are out there exist in the world and you're going and like capturing them. And mm-hmm. then your input is really like reading or, or like deciding how you want, if you want to crossbreed them, which plorts you want to generate, things like that. It's weird that, that <laughs> I know that the chronology doesn't work out this way, but I mean, there's like the slime breeding stuff within Stardew Valley, which I oh, didn't yeah. really get into, but it's weird to like, if that's the focus of the entire game, then it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like if that's all you have to focus on and just go out and explore. But you talk about like, it's a game where you learn through through experimentation. Do you feel like it needs more guidance out of the gate? Like it's been in early access for so long and it's popular and so people have built up facts and they seem to know what they're doing. But for this wider release now, do you feel like it struggles with training? I intentionally avoided doing a whole lot of like, looking online for help. I tried to 
you know, assess it using what the game provided. And the one, my one complaint about it, I think, is that there are, there are a couple things that are absolutely like the core of your, like, this is how you get further in the game. And it doesn't totally communicate to you how important that is. So Just money? That's the trap that I fell into at first. It's thinking like, well, I mean, I'm making some good money. I'm getting some upgrades. I feel like I should be doing more. Like there are these locked doors that I don't know how to get into. Like, There's what, more to life than just money, like it? locked doors. Well, I was just trying to figure out like what, you know, what these, the game didn't really tell me what these doors are for or yeah. how or how I open them. So what I'm, I'm going to tell people who are listening because I, I wish that I had known going, I felt like I wasted some time figuring it out. And that was like, Around in the world, you're going to find some large versions of slimes, like super big ones that yeah. don't move, called Gordos. And, Great name. Uh, some of them, you basically have to feed them that slimes, like food that slime will eat. So if it's a, if it's a uh, big blue slime, it'll eat vegetables. So you feed it 50 vegetables, and then it explodes, and will either reveal like a teleporter that gets you to gets you to other places oh. or it'll drop a key that you then use to unlock those slime doors. And when you unlock the slime doors, those lead to new areas with new slimes, with new slime doors. And that's how you like progress through the world. So we should be hunting Gordos. Yeah. Do those big ones. Can you bring them back to your, your camp and, and have them, what is it? Plort or Paul Blart? <laughs> no. What is it? <laughs> yeah, it's Paul Blart in your mouth. Yeah, there you go. You yeah. play it, man. Dude, Gordo's plorting. I'm, I'm definitely going to play no, this. No, no. They, they stay where they are, so you basically just feed them. They explode. You you harvest what they explode, and that helps you get further in the game. Okay. Awesome. What a delight. Uh, what would you give this game? I give it an 8.5. I really wow. liked it. Out of the blue for yeah. you, huh? Yeah. I mean, like, I got super addicted to it. Oh, that's I mean, great I still hear. am. I'm still, I'm still playing it. I'm oh, getting on board. So, there we go. Uh, speaking of uh, trouble with the on-ramp... Fortnite from Epic Games. Yeah. Uh, so last time we talked about it on the podcast was with Jamie. Ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, we did Skype in a long time ago. Um, actually, they were in the office. But uh, last time we talked about it on the podcast with JV, we talked a lot about the tutorial and building up and how it's kind of overwhelming out of the gate. So, Reiner, I'm curious, after you spent more time with it, what is not necessarily the end game, but what does the advanced game look like? Uh, where are the strengths? Where are the weaknesses? Yeah, a lot of the same, I'll say. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> there's not a lot of variety. It, it sounds like a really complex game, but there really isn't much to it when you really boil it down to the gameplay that's there. Yeah. So what is it? What is Fortnite? It is a sandbox scavenging resource management uh, camp building Fort building combat game. Minecraft Orcs Must Die. With co-op. Yeah. Four-player co-op. Uh, yeah, Tim Sweeney, I think, called it Minecraft meets meets that. Yeah. Um, but so you're doing all these things. Basically, when you land in a in a in an area with your team in tow, if you have you usually have three people with you, right? Um, you land there, and the first thing you want to do is go find uh this device that's gonna kind of tame the storm that's making these these zombies, right? Yeah. And uh, that means you have to scavenge over this kind of open world area. And it's they're fairly sizable. I don't know. You, you'll take some time to get across it. But you can all scatter and kind of, I don't know, see most of the map in a matter of minutes, right? Uh, but you're going into houses, stuff like that. You're, you're looting through trash, going into toilets, uh, doing everything you can to get resources to build stuff that you're going to need you're going right. to need like wood metal stone uh for your building of the camps but you're also going to need all sorts of different things to build bullets and weapons and all that stuff right um as you go through this because once the action starts it's relentless and it goes on for a long time and is it fun yeah so once you find your little device you activate it you build a camp around it and basically that's it's really easy basically you just have um you hit the B button on, on Xbox. That's what I'm playing it on. And it brings up an option to build a wall. You hit the RB button that turns into a floor or a ceiling. So you can build it very quickly and just throw it down and you see it just start assembling. It's very yeah. Disney Infinity-esque, Minecraft-esque, right? Like it's just instantly there. Um, that is going to fortify your this little thing that you're pr trying to protect because these zombies called husks are coming after that thing. And there's these little storm pockets that you'll see on the ground that will, you know, lightning will shoot out and all of a sudden there's like a swarm of them coming at you. They're slow moving. There's not a lot of variety to them, even in 
I'm what, 30 hours into this thing, I think yeah. now. Mm. Um, but you should be able to manage it. And it's kind of got a horde mode kind of feeling to it in that it's just wave after wave after wave of enemies. And the game outside of that core gameplay, like all the menus, all the stats, all the upgrades, after 30 hours, does it feel more natural? Can you navigate it? Does it feel good? It is the busiest like yeah. HUD screen I've ever seen in a game. I mean, there's tons of stuff going on at any given time. It's it's a little maddening in that. You're still not used to it. No, and and I mean, even in the menus, when when you're out of the map, it's like you got your survivors to take care of. You got all these you know different camps of people to take care of and level up. Yeah. You're not just leveling up yourself. You're leveling up like everyone that you 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 uh, come across. You know that you open up loot crates and you'll get survivors in there, and it's like. Okay, this one's purple. He's better. Or I'm going to slot him in as a survivor or technician over here or something. And it's there's a lot of depth there. But the variety doesn't back up that depth yet, right? And they, they're calling this a closed beta right now, which is really misleading if you buy it at retail. You can buy it on a store shelf, which is, it, I mean, we had discussions internally. We're like, well, what does that mean? How different is that from early access where technically people could buy it? Like, is it more misleading if it's like, oh, it's just a label on a box on a shelf. Yeah. People are still going to pick it up, not knowing that it's kind of still in progress. So mm-hmm. I went and uh, looked at a package in the store and yeah. nowhere on the front does it say anything about it being early access or Ooh, uh, closed beta. And then on the back, it says early access pack. And it just lists like a bunch of items you're getting. But it doesn't say the game's like not finished yet, it not in closed beta or whatever. I don't know what this means anymore, by the way. Yeah. Like this whole <laughs> alpha beta stuff, like I don't it doesn't matter anymore. Well, it's, Dan's alpha. It, it, well, definitely. But <laughs> but the term but yeah, the gaming terms for it have become increasingly useless, right? Like a beta used to actually be a beta. And now a beta is just like a, a stress test in most in most cases. Mm-hmm. And, and I understand that part, but when it comes to selling betas no. on retail shelves, yeah. that's the new layer of oh, it's just game on. Everyone, already, <laughs> nothing means anything anymore. We're I in thought. that new frontier. We have games that are in early access for like four or five years. We have games yeah. that never come out of early access. Richard it's, Garriott's it's fantastic game, Shroud of the Avatar, coming out in early access anytime <laughs> soon here. <laughs> but it's going to be free to play next year when it's officially done. Then, right? That's so weird. It is. Is it just? I'm trying to think. Does has Microsoft endorsed that strategy as well? Because even like Tomorrow yes. Children from Q Games, they also got out of the gate with like, oh, this costs money, right. but then eventually we'll make it free to play. Which Fable is Fortune is the exact same is that, yeah. It's a horse <laughs> strategy. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Uh, I don't understand it. But I'm down on the game like, as I talk about it. The gameplay especially, it's just, it feels like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over, going into the same areas over and over and over. And there's four different zones, but... Man, it takes time to get to that second zone. You got to go but, through but mission the, after mission after mission. And some of the missions you take, say, complete this zone twice, like this nine star zone twice. Uh, so it's like, man, that's that's over an hour just set for that one mission. And I need to do four to get to the next tier in this area. It's it's maddening how much is there. It's cool huh. if you want bang for your buck. I mean, there's tons of game there, and I am addicted to the loops okay. of the loot. Like, okay. the stuff I'm getting. Like, I want the better weapons. I want the the better survivors. I want to, you know, send people out on these, these scavenging well, missions. Well, then the menus are working. So, Well, I mean, no, because it's oh. still like, oh, my God, I come here, and it's not like I'm done in a matter of seconds. It's like, okay, I got a bunch of stuff I got to take care of. So does it feel like a chore that you're grinding, or does it feel fun? Parts of it feel like a chore. Uh, and then, also, and then the <laughs> gameplay itself, I just want more variety, right. whether that's in enemies, how they even attack, you yeah. know, it'll just always, the storm will always be like right in front of me. And it's like, they could come from over here to the South or, you know, like all vectors. But so some you, of the zombies are baseball players and they throw baseball, they, which is pretty cool. They throw bones. You talk about the oh, color coded rarity and survivors. Is this like a, a mobile gotcha kind of system where you want it, to get the five star <laughs> legendary guy yeah it, it, it totally oh, feels God. everything's in this game I, I every know. system God. to make money Whoa. is go- in this game in some capacity <laughs> they right. have they have loot chests and then they have loot pinatas I mean, that you hit with a shovel literal or loot pinata. well that's yeah. some, it's that's going some to be self. free to play they're gonna they're gonna milk you for it in, in other ways i just All wish right. they milk me in a cleaner way <laughs> i wish the yeah, milking milk, laboratory milk is clean so you know milk yeah. is clean that's right dan for the last time but if you're looking for like a four-player co-op game that's a little different Overcooked. and has a lot of depth. <laughs> <laughs> On Switch, preferably. Oh, mm. Don't play that one yet, yeah, from not. what I'm hearing. Uh, so uh, you re- we, you would recommend it? I do. I, I recommend it. Uh, again, I don't know what's going to happen next year when it goes free to play, what that's going to mean for the loot systems and, and how it plays and all that. Uh, but what's there is is pretty satisfying. It's just very repetitive. So... 
Um, you know, I don't think this is a game you're going to want to sit down and play 12 hours each day. It's hmm. going to start all feeling the same after a while. But I've been going at it three, four hours a day, and that, that seems about right for me. And then I'm like, okay, I now I am feeling like this is starting to tax tax me a little bit. So, yeah, I'll um, be damned. But it's cool. I'm trying to think of what games I would play for 12 hours each day regularly. Overwatch, Stardew Valley. World of Warcraft. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got, Joe? I, I, I don't know if there is. I mean, there are games that I would play for 12 hours each day for seven days and then i beat the game but it's just mm-hmm. like like the eternal prospect of spending that kind of time with the game i don't know battlefield apparently, one call of duty any of those player games. unknown battlegrounds pokemon player go unknown. apparently for these jackals <laughs> just, just oh play God. final fantasy 6 again and again and again yeah it's not a bad idea no yeah, i could do that uh hey speaking of taxing hey. Ryan said that word a long time ago dan tech hello <laughs> hello um, <laughs> i am here <laughs> now you have to sing no taxing you've been no, on this whole podcast this is the first time you've talked to him no I don't know. He's just being handsome. <laughs> he crapped on Elise earlier or something. I oh. did not. No, it's I'm sorry I didn't like that game. No, that's Jeez. Fine. No, I better it. apologize. <laughs> what, what game? Uh, Tacoma. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I'm sorry for offering that opinion. I loved it. No, I love it. No, I didn't. No, I love that game. <laughs> uh, a couple months ago, you talked about, uh, I forget it was at PAX, you played Kingsway. That's right. That was my first time seeing that game. That's right. Uh, so this is the novel game, if you recall our discussion. It is an RPG that's modeled after windows 95 that's right. ui yeah and everything clever that you could possibly imagine is packed into that experimentation it's basically a very traditional standard rpg you know you level up you get loot you equip your guy you try to go through there's permadeath so it's a roguelike uh the island is generated randomly each time you play but the big gimmick is with the windows managing windows all kinds of windows everywhere the enemy window moves around in a pattern fitting to the enemy so did like, you play in windowed mode no. Okay, thank God. So, like, you've got a jellyfish that moves up and down. You've got enemy attacks that might go like this, and you've got to click both buttons, or icicles that fall from the ceiling, and you've got to, like, go click, click, click fast okay. so they don't hit the ground or you get hurt. Fireballs that sort of weave across, arrows, all kinds of all kinds of junk like that. And it's really cool for the first, like, couple hours. But it doesn't really ever get really deep with that system. Like, that, what I just said, those sort of gimmicky things are as far as it goes. Or like an enemy will hit you and some enemies have attacks that will like close in a window, which can be very, very stressful. <laughs> like, like, I really need my inventory there. Right? I got to drink that potion. That sounds fun. Your window, cl- it is. But it only works for a certain amount of time because the game itself, once you get your feet, since it is permadeath, you'll probably spend an hour or two learning the game and figuring out how to like exploit all the different abilities and, oh, I should equip this and I want to do this and this is how the system works. Once you've got the systems down, it should take you about two hours to complete the game. And then you're just basically chasing down different endings. But it's hmm. the same. You're going to be killing the same crap, the same bosses. Even though it's procedurally generated, it's like, okay, I know the boss of this dungeon is going to be this cultist leader. He's going to summon a skeleton every so often, and I'm going to have to manage that because they're going to get in front of his window pane, and then I can't hit him. Mm-hmm. And then it's, it's, they could get all over the screen. Again, this is the cool part of the game. That gimmick works. It is a very cool part of the game. But the game itself only takes a couple hours to beat. And after that, you're just unlocking new classes and trying to find new endings. Is, and is there a universe, though, where it's like, hey, it's going to be one of the most novel experiences in gaming you can have this year, realistically? I'm sure that's what they were going for. Like, it's supposed to be like a cute battle system, sort of like in the, in the vein of Undertale, maybe. Like, yeah. this is this is unique. This is clever. And I agree. The battle system is. The game itself just doesn't have legs to last more than four or five hours of entertainment, unless <sighs> you're hardcore. Undertale doesn't either. I can't play that 12 hours. Unless you're like hardcore and you want to like, there are multiple endings and you've got to do weird stuff to get them. So if you really want to dig deep, that's great. But for me, the motivation isn't there because you're, you start up again. You're like, okay, I know what the broken abilities are. I know where to go get these cool items. And then you're killing the same. The gimmick is cool at first, but it's like, okay. No, I, I get it. The idea of of generating two hours of interesting content and then spreading it over six hours or you know like that's yeah. th- that's a problem it doesn't matter how like interesting and novel something is the first time if the expectation is you just like keep doing it to like get the real game well what sounds familiar yeah <laughs> what's, what's the most clever thing the game does with that presentation uh, style that is a really good question again the icicles falling or rock traps or arrows but can't you like go in like the settings and stuff and tweak things like there is a hard UI? mode you can unlock uh, I don't think anyone's beat. I, I don't know if anyone's beaten that. No, that's either. not clever. I'm talking about like you're talking just UI stuff. Yeah, like can't you like dig through the system UI well, more whole, than you'd expect? Yeah, well, more than because like the whole point is you're supposed to have a bunch of windows up, and it gets harder the more windows you have. But if you want to have extra bag space, say that's another window. You want another bag? That's another window. So you've got windows layered upon windows, and they're all closing and 
and popping all over the place. Like, and windows are appearing above those windows and they'll be like, I can't hit my attack button because my screen's moved over here. <laughs> and then there's an arrow flying across it. Or like the enemies are like spamming little babies all over the place. It's just like malware pop up. popping up all over your computer. That's, it sounds like that's, the that's best actually the comparison I made in my review. Yes. Oh really? Yeah, it's actually. malware, the RPG. Yeah. I heard that there's status effects and the status effects then are represented by showing like programs open in the lower right. You know, I, yeah, that's correct. In the, in the task. See, bar. that kind of stuff's cute. Again, I love the gimmick. I love the concept. Yeah. There's just not a whole lot there. I know. I'm just trying to get... It sounds like a cute video to watch for 10 minutes. I think, I think a lot of people would have fun with this. It's only like, it's, it's, it's cool for the, for the, for those two, for those few hours. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it could be madness when it's really going crazy. It is. And again, it's really cool. I'm on board. But it's a limited edition cool. Did you change your facial expressions while playing it? I did. Yes. I'll be damned. Let's see. Let's see your King's White face. He's nodding. Okay, you he's see nodding. icicles falling. I, now I he has that? three fingers up his nose. Right, you gotta, no one you gotta knows really what he's fast. To express. <laughs> you'll, you'll know. You'll you'll get the icicle thing down, man. Because if you miss those icicles, you're gonna get hurt. And that was another thing. Like the yeah. uh, the repetition with the enemies was just like really yeah. really stupid at times. Like in the final castle, there's only like three different kinds of enemies. And it's just like okay, here that we do this again. Castle. Two fireballs. This is two Fortnite. fireballs. We're just talking about Fortnite. It's the same thing. Everything's again, the same game. That's I, what we've learned. If you're looking for a unique gimmicky thing that you just want to play for a few hours and you know knock around a few golf balls kind of thing, it's uh, play it, Pony Island, or you could play Pony Island, or or you could play this. I'll uh, be damned. I no, gave it a seven I, seven five, and I think it, it was really cool for the for that time period. Got it. Yeah. Neat. I Reiner. Was, I was gonna say Pony Island is a, is a game that plays with similar sort of like weird meta kinds of things but is over faster and doesn't wear out its welcome do you think the meta video games are ever going to wear out their welcome in general or it's gonna be like all right we're all aware that these are video games you don't need to keep referencing that are we going to get stanley stanley parable to death i don't think we i mean i don't think we are yeah. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't get too of many of these year, a year yeah. yeah yeah i agree uh hey Rainer, <laughs> do you want to you want to <laughs> give yourself a clap see you guys kyle hilliard hey man a lot of people getting in here. Yeah, it's uh, a good show. You're here to talk about Professor Layton on iOS for exactly one minute. Okay. You don't like this game. <laughs> this is not a good Layton game. Why did you insist on being on this podcast? Well, because I wanted to read you guys a puzzle and see if you guys could solve it. Okay, what's the name of this game, first of all? Uh, it's really going to put me on the spot, yeah. aren't you? It's Layton's <laughs> Puzzle Journey Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy. Are you crapping on me? No. That's really the name? That's the full title. You blorting us. <laughs> that's not that bad. Uh, that sounds that, like a load of plort to me. Is that a reference? I really do want to play. I'm playing that game tonight. What's that? <laughs> okay. Take it away, Kyle. Okay. This is a, a puzzle. This is one of the puzzles in the game. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. You guys, Hanson, you have notes, so you can take notes if you want. Uh, there is a sunny island that's always warm. A popular fish sold at the shops is packed in ice to keep it at the optimum temperature for freshness. It needs two blocks for one day. And three blocks for two days. Three blocks of ice? Mm -hmm. Hang on. Three blocks? Two for one day, three for two days. Two blocks. Hang on. Let's, let's slow down here. Okay. One day. I Hang on. I can't read my own hand. Three blocks for two days. Three for oh, two days. Okay. You didn't tell me it was a math puzzle. Yeah, so I, I would have brought paper. For example, five blocks, a five blocks would be required for three days. So you got five for three days. A new fish has just been caught. What is the minimum number of ice blocks needed to keep it fresh for one week? Who likes this kind of thing? I People usually, pay money for this? I usually do like this kind of thing. Okay, so what was the conclusion question again? Uh, how much? Uh, I, how many ice blocks would you need to keep it fresh for one week? Okay. One fish for one week? Yes, to keep it fresh for one week. Okay, so... Eight. Hold on. So they say five, five for three days. Yeah, here, I'll go to two Hold for... Hold on, no, no. Okay. So five for three days, so then that would mean... That you need to add. Wait a second. Okay. I if you guys want, I can skip to the answer. You guys ready for the no, answer? No, no, whoa, 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 right. whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Right. Five right. for three days. So how long? How long is a week? Seven. Yeah. Okay. In this universe, yeah. Uh, no, uh, they get work weeks. You know. Yeah, yeah. Five for three days. Then it's six. Six for four days. Eight for five days. Nine for for. Six days. And then I think you'd stop there because like the next day it would still, it would be fresh, right? Mm hmm Sure. What? You guys, you guys ready to give me a number? This? Twelve. Sucks. Twelve? I'm not okay. Copernicus. No one can come okay. up with this Nine. stuff. Nine. The answer is zero. 
Because if you put the fish in a tank and let it live, you wouldn't need any ice blocks. That's really clever. That No, it's not. That's so clever. That I didn't think about that. That is a stupid puzzle. Talk about thinking outside the what? tank. What? I did. I hate that for puzzle design. Yeah, that's really dumb. I don't know how you guys feel All about right, this that. game is dumb. It's like how much dirt is in a hole. It's just that yeah. crap. And, and it's like a lot of the puzzles are like that, where it just tricks you. How much does a pound to, of feathers weigh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's just representative of what? of what the game like the game has several puzzles like yes. that I will say there are some puzzles I enjoyed but this I feel like I saw a lot more puzzles like this where it just sets you up it just obscures facts and it just let it makes you try to come up with something that it didn't even present as an option Is it still level 5 making it? Yep. Yeah, still level 5. It's, but it's just night and day as far as puzzle design goes. <sighs> I mean, latent games always have a couple duds. I feel like there are more duds in this game than there are in previous latent games. I'll be damned. And that is like the best example of a pu of the worst puzzle. What's the best hmm. Professor Layton game to play? Um, I liked Azran Legacy, which is the last one I reviewed. And the first one is really good, too. Well, there it, we go. All right, sit tuned, everybody. We've got community emails coming up now. Uh, I do like... There we go. Like the community character. emails. No, 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 no. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We have some great emails that people sent in to what email address, Antec? Uh, Game Informer at podcast. Podcast at Game Informer. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was like, uh... Podcast at Game Informer com. I we, send all my emails there. Honestly, <laughs> I think that it was the best batch I've ever read through. It was like one wow. in three. I was like, this is really good. And but, then there is some spam in there as well. But most of it <laughs> was very good stuff. So questions, feedback, anything you want, send it into podcastgameformer.com. We read through our favorite emails, and then we pick our absolute favorite of that batch, which boils it down to just pure essence, the pure diamond of community feedback, uh, and then we ship them out something really nice. That's right. Now, Ben, when you say people can send anything they want, like what what kinds of things are permissible to send to podcast at Game Informer? There was that Any one guy who sent the fish email that I really liked. It's just like, I like fish. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Awesome from Roseville, Mr. Fishman himself. Uh, I, I love any emails. Here's the here's the conundrum. Uh, some people only watch the show on YouTube, and so sometimes I get emails where it's a very visual thing, mm -hmm. and I always uh, I always think of the audio listeners. So those types of emails I typically won't pick up. But outside mm -hmm. of that, Joe, anything that can be conveyed through audio, all for. All right. Anything you want. You can send it an email, Joe. <laughs> yeah, just make up a, you know... Dear podcast at gamerformer.com, please get a new host with a better voice. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be nice if I had a better voice? I think about it all the time. Well, now if you get that email, you'll know it's Joe. Oh, That's true. Uh, oh, uh, last week, Joe, I assume you recall uh, we had Imran in here. Oh, yeah. And we we're talking all about deaths in the Star Wars universe Uh huh. and whether there's ever been a peaceful death outside of Yoda. Right. Within Star Wars films. I remember that. Chuck, for, Chuck from Maine writes in. He says, the answer... Uh, to the question of who other than Yoda dies a gentle death in Star Wars, there's only one answer I know of, the Republic. Man, that's... Uh... <laughs> I, it's an interesting answer. It's, that, it's, it's an interesting, but remember, it, it dies to thunderous applause. That's not calm, that's thunderous. Well, if there was a crowd for when Yoda died, I'm sure that Senate oh, would have erupted in applause <laughs> as well. <laughs> They would have put a little nah, Snickers bar on his pillow where he disappeared Solemn from. Solemn <laughs> Snickers bar. Whatever he ate from Luke. You have the weirdest family traditions. <laughs> two, two Snickers minis over the eyes. <laughs> oh, boy. Put the Butterfinger on Grandpa's bed, everyone. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Kate Willert also writes in and says, I was kind of surprised by the speculation in the last episode about when the next generation of console starts. Ready for this twist? I think this is the third time we've ever heard an email like this. Well, mm -hmm. Kate's surprised because she says, the Switch is already here. Wii was the same generation as PS3 360. Wii U was the same generation as PS4 Xbox One and was retired early. If Switch is a console rather than a handheld, it's the start of the next generation. The next generation is already here with the Nintendo Switch. Which uh... I, it's so stupid. <laughs> I mean, not so, Kate isn't stupid. It's so stupid not to think of that. Of like, oh yeah, I guess technically if you want to adhere to like, of course, of course, like the old three-way race, going back to the origins of the 128 wars. Yeah, this is the right. next gen. But the thing is, we haven't had that race for some time now. Like, not 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 how it used to be, where everyone drops their console at about the same time, right? Nintendo's it's, horse just ran through the gates, and now it's running around in the parking Nintendo's lot. Nintendo's done the like you know the beat of their own drum thing for like since what like GameCube ish. Like, oh, yeah. Wii. like like at, yeah, we we certainly. I, I think we marks the point at which Nintendo diverged from what we would call like gen like hardware generation cycles yeah. and they're and they're just doing their thing and like 
I don't mean, but even that, I mean, no, no, it was no, no. launched like on, the same week as PS3. I don't mean for this to sound dismissive of Nintendo. It's, in yeah, sense. It's like, like I, I don't intend to say like, well, they don't even, we don't even consider them as part of the generation because their consoles are so underpowered or whatever. Because like, that's not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're like, they are, they are doing their own thing on their own schedule. And, and they even say that. I mean, that was a big yeah. message from Awada with the launch of the Wii and Wii yeah. U is like, yeah, we're, we're in our own playpen over here. Yeah, we don't yeah. need you guys. Yeah. We're doing okay. Because yeah. Also, by that logic, we're in generation infinity because PCs keep getting upgraded and upgraded. You know, well, so like, well no oh, consoles yeah. are different. Would you not call the Switch a console? I'm I mean, just saying the console race I mean, is, a very is it. Yeah. Is it a thing. console? Is it a handheld that straddles that line? It's well, both. I'm, I'm just, I'm just it saying. Is. I think when people, I think it's clear when we're talking that like Mike, Microsoft and Sony are the only ones who are operating on a sort of like generational sort of Tradition, step ladder. Traditional console generation war. Yeah. Even if they, and whether or not they still are is what we were debating last week. That's so. right. Uh, I think Reiner said the PS5 is coming out next month or something. He did, he did say something. Um, so uh, Kate's also wondering if Sony and Microsoft are also working on a handheld console hybrid because she bets they are. Uh, I doubt it. But I mean, it's tough I, to ignore I, I that people seem to like the Switch. Unlikely. I think it would be amazing, but it seems like a long shot to yeah. me. Yeah, uh, Jerry from Arizona says, "Hello, GI team. Hello. I have an email specifically for Juba if he's on the Ooh, podcast. Boom. I am. Uh, in the dead of night on the twenty eighth, he says this tweet was sent out. Quote: oh, I boy. just finished Horizon, and it was better than Breath <laughs> of the <laughs> Wild <laughs> in every way. Yeah. Uh, simply put, says Jerry." Defend this claim. By the way, Joe, <laughs> I agree with you, says Jerry. I want to make clear that was Jerry from Arizona, not me. Because uh, that seems like claim. the incorrect statement. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so it was brought to my attention after I tweeted that, by the way, that it seemed that it seemed like I was deliberately trying to like ruffle feathers with that. Don't you at weren't? Me. Really? I, I honestly <laughs> wasn't. To me, to me, it was more like I those games were have been compared because they came out so close to each other. I, I keep seeing them compared in different ways back and forth. And like, th this was just sort of me. We've talked about Zelda before. I don't need to go into it. I, I enjoyed Zelda. I like that game. Prove it. I think to defend the claim. Yeah. I guess when you're, when you're looking at all of the pillars of a game that, for, and I also don't mean to say that this is like, objectively, this is the case. In my, in my personal opinion, I think which I think is implied when it's a tweet of mine that that it's a better game. More objective tweets. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so when you look at the pillars of, of a game like that that I'm interested in, like I'm interested in the characters, I'm interested in the story, I'm interested in the combat, I'm interested in the setting. And I think Horizon beats Zelda in that, in that regard for all of them in the way that like it introduces mysteries, it you know touches base with them periodically, periodically throughout the story and wraps them up all in the course of like critical path. Whereas Zelda, even though it does have some of that, you really have to go out of your way to find those little like locations to get that, that past story stuff. And even then your main character, and this is a, you know, a beef I've had with Link for however long is that like Link isn't a character to me. Link is meant, is, is meant to be a vessel that like you as the player inhabit or whatever. And you just don't buy it. You hate that. I, I just don't like that in games. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, like whereas like Aloy, fun. Aloy feels like a character. I like from that early section of that game when she and Rost are sort of like doing their things. Like I was invested in her. I was invested in Rost. I wanted to know why she was outcast. And like, I but was kind of like the console thing. Like you can't fault Nintendo for that. Cause it's a game they're not even trying to play. It's not like they're pitching like, Oh, Link is a memorable character this time around. You guys, hey, he has real fact, emotions. Look, so my, def my, my response to that is basically like, I don't care what, like it's great if you achieve your goal. If if this is if yeah, that's your goal well, and that's what you want to make, that's great for you. But that doesn't mean what you what you were trying to make I is think, good. I, I think they're just doing very different things. You know, I think Link is a character that a lot of people have grown up with, and it has a different impact on people. Whereas Aloy, you're right, is a very well written, established character. I know, but Elise, who would win in a fight? <laughs> <laughs> I hope Aloy is just, just no, so that, bad. That'd be a tough match. I don't what know. Is? Does he have a guardian arrow? I mean, yeah, dude, or, Link or, has stuff that like cheats outside of the, like the universe that Alloy Alloy's in some, you know, semblance of reality. Link just has like all kinds of stuff that isn't, like doesn't what? have a, a one-to-one -one futuristic component. Like he's literally like could become invincible against her, right? Okay. I don't think so. So character story. <laughs> yeah. Combat. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed, I enjoyed fighting in Zelda, but again, as I've talked about before, the weapon thing was a problem for me and just like, like it didn't feel like there was a lot of strategy for it. You couldn't establish a play style really in Zelda because mm -hmm. because so much of what you could do was dependent on the gear that you happened to be carrying 
what Interesting. It, what it's your, whereas in Horizon, the way that you like build out your skill points, the the weapons you buy, how you outfit them with different like augmentations and stuff. Mm-hmm. For me, that made combat a lot more rewarding, allowed me to establish a play style that I liked. Yeah, there's comf- comfy ruts, I think they call it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side, what does Breath of the Wild do better than Horizon in your mind? Is there anything? I guess I like the thing that I really liked in Breath of the Wild. Mm, I really liked the like I liked the shrines. I like I like those those puzzles. But again, I have I wish that they were not just these little like one off things. I liked I liked the idea of more traditional dungeons, which Breath of the Wild didn't really have. Being, more reflecting light. But yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. gotcha. So ultimately, like for me, in in every way for me that like really matters in defining that kind of experience for me, Horizon Horizon took it away. Why didn't you fit that into 140 characters? Yeah, it was a little tough. <laughs> yeah. uh, J.D. Biddle from Salt Lake City, Utah, writes in um, with a long email, but I think it's interesting just talking about how uh, they were excited to play Friday the 13th, which a story just went up yesterday about like uh-huh. how it sold over... 1.8 million. That's mm-hmm. wild. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as Dan, I think, pointed out in our I, conversation. Again, it's just, I, I just was not surprised. It's, it's, it's such a completely propelled by, by streaming, man. Yeah. yeah. You, go, you get on there, you know, your favorite streamer is like, Hey, whoa, get killed. This is really cool. Hang and on, like, is that a channel um, I can follow? That sounds good. It is. No, I mean, I remember when uh, we were reviewing that here in the office and like, like I was constantly standing at people's desks and just watching the matches unfold. Yeah. Like I only played a few matches, but I just loved I was watching like, that game. I was super into like the concept, but then, so, you know, I tried it, I think a week after it came out and I could not get into, you, you, you honestly cannot get into a game unless you're inviting your own friends. That's and exactly yeah. what That's JD Biddle's writing about, playing. where they bought it uh, for Ridiculous. Xbox One and you cannot get into a public game. Like it's broken, it's unplayable. It's, yeah. Uh, and yeah. they're frustrated. Like, how was it ever released if it's this unplayable? Is it That's a great still question. still unplayable like That's what he that? says. It hasn't been patched. That's you can ridiculous. still invite friends. Uh, okay. But yeah, he says, uh, oh. since release, May 26, Xbox users are still waiting for the patch to be able to start and play the game as it was atten- intended. Do you think Microsoft and Sony, I'm sure it's a lot of hoops developers have to jump through, but they need to up their search standards if this kind of stuff is getting through? Network wise, it seems insane. I, I think they have to they have to offer refunds on stuff like that. You know, Steam has been that that's what like and a lot of people on Steam are like, whoa, you know what? Forget this. Boom, yeah. hit refund button, and then that's it. You know, they, it's out of their mind. Mm-hmm. But yeah, hopefully you haven't spent two hours waiting in lobbies. Correct. Uh, <laughs> but well, I, ho- I hope lot. I hope after the first hour waiting in lobbies, you'd be like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the next hour is not going to be any different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a wild story. Uh, Khalid from Saudi Arabia writes in and says, "What's up?" Uh, what's up? Just podcasting. That, that, is that the email? Yeah. What are you doing? Now we're hanging out. We're yeah, talking about chilling. plorts. Plorts and gordos are the manner. Uh, I, I'm going to yeah. check those out tonight. Yeah. yeah. At least how's your week going? It's going good. Good. Can't what complain. has been the most notable thing that's happened to you this week at work? <sighs> at work? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Posted that Tacoma review. <laughs> I mean, is that really? JV has not insulted me that much today. Does he no. insult you a lot? Surprising. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like uh, you and JV yeah. uh, is a friendship that has not surfaced that much in Game Informer's content. Is That's that a true. weird thing uh, to say? We, we were saying that we we uh, we should do more like streaming together and stuff. Yeah, that would we be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's normally a dickhead. That's... Uh, yeah, complete dickhead. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, I sit between them. Wow. And and Joe Joe knows. All yeah. but a- Though Elise throws her share fair share also. Ooh. Um, what kind of stuff are we talking about here? Ah, they, like, it's it's really just dumb stuff. They play dumb pranks on each other. Are they, they funny? I I mean no. They just oh. say no. things like <laughs> they tell each other they're the worst all the time. I, I go over and I mess everything up on his desk. Oh yeah. You should mess up his yeah. hair. Might get it back in can't, order. Can't do that. <laughs> uh Mason. Mason Cowell says, Hello, crew. Uh my question today is twofold. Which I read as twelfth. Uh, for skimming. That's not what that word is. We got a double here. Yeah, we got a twelfth. Uh, first off, what game had the largest stretch of time between you playing it for the first time and eventually completing it? For example, I started Ocarina of Time when I was six years old, but got stuck at the Water Temple and didn't finish it until I was twenty-one. Oh god! Well, I'm not going to be wow. able to beat that. My god! Damn. Pretty wild. Uh, he also says, uh, "What game have you started and have been aiming to finish for the longest stretch of time?" But I think that first one's more interesting. I guess. I, it, I think there's a difference between restarting a game as an adult that you couldn't beat as a kid mm-hmm. versus picking up literally an old save 
and going from that exact point on. Right. I like picking up the saves. So this is going to be. Oh man. Picking but it doesn't have to saves? be. It doesn't have to be. I'm just saying. I think that's a more interesting idea. Yeah, I, I agree. I'd say there I have was an a... answer to both. To both. Yes. Real quick. I have an answer to one. Uh, for me, the pickup one is like I actually never beat Mario, like Super Mario Brothers, when I was a kid. I haven't either. Despite yeah. I mean, despite right. having it and playing it for however many times, like I could never beat. I don't know. I was like seven years old. I couldn't beat like Bowser's Bowser's Castle at the end. So mm-hmm. I finally did that when I reviewed the GBA re-release of Super Mario Brothers. Like I don't know, eight years ago. Or oh, something. weird. Yeah. Um, so I finally actually beat it. Then that's a good one. Anything stand out? Uh, it's actually still a great game. Yeah, like I like I, it's one of those where it's like, oh, this is a, a classic that's just got its place in history. But yeah. it, it, it's fun. It's it's a fun game. <laughs> There's a reason. And uh, then the other one for me is the is the Witcher, uh, Witcher three, where I put it down. Like I played it for like ten hours right when it first came out. Yeah, and put it down for like six months. And then I did the same thing. Late in the year, like as we were coming up to like end of the year discussions and stuff, I was like, God, I got to finish The Witcher. And I picked up my save right where I left off and was super lost for a few hours <laughs> and then I, managed to like get super into it. And, and I used through. to do that with a lot of RPGs, like big RPGs. I would just spread them out over like a full year. I think I did that with like Inquisition too. Mm. And I don't know. It was just kind of preferable to me to like just take my time and just enjoy an open world. And I don't really have that luxury anymore. Um, but I think one game that it's, it's a kind of similar thing to, to his email where, uh, I used to play Donkey Kong country, Mm. like the first game, like so much on my SNES growing up. And I got to like, I think one of the very later levels and I couldn't beat it. And I just kept going instead. I just kind of gave up and I just kept going back to like older levels and that was just the thing I did was I'd yeah. play my favorite levels again and again. And then, like, I grew up and, I don't know, I must have been, like, teenage years at this point. And I was just like, oh, I should actually beat that thing. And you did so, it? Yeah. And now you feel like... Now I feel fulfilled. You've passed into womanhood <laughs> officially. I have completed the milestone. Yeah. I had a similar thing with, like, Darkwing Duck on NES. And then I was just thinking about it. This question prompt. I was like, man, I remember getting completely stuck in Garfield caught in the act on Game Gear, the worst yeah. version of a bad game, uh, on this totem pole puzzle. And I wonder, like, as an adult, could I go back to that and just be like, oh, clearly this is it. At some point, I'm going to finish Garfield caught in the act, Dan. But, I'm going to uh, free Garfield because he got sucked into that TV <laughs> and it's not right. John Arbuckle why you'd misses want him. to, but yeah, go for it. Uh, so mine would be, uh, I don't know when it came out, but Fantasy Star 4. Mm. I used I did not have a Genesis, so I would always have to go to it was a relative's friend's house, right? So Especially. I'd be over there a lot or something. So I'd always mm-hmm. play Genesis while I was over there because I had the SNES, they had the Genesis. So like I never got through with that. So I went back like two years ago and finally finished it when it came on Steam. Ooh, boy, that's that's, so that's, crazy. A, that's a huge gap. That's like uh, what, yes. twenty years? Yeah. That's really huge. Also, it's bold to be over at someone's house and be like, I'm gonna start this RPG. <laughs> no, this was <laughs> We were over there a lot, right? Oh, so really? it was like, yeah. I, I, I actually completed Fantasy Star 2 over there, like Holy on the, on the second uh, Master Why did you spend so much time there? We were like friends that lived really close to each other. Okay. Yeah. Right, no, I, no, I, I, I had the Nintendo systems and they had the That's, Sega systems. That sounds fine. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, sure. Nice. Uh, Corey from New Hampshire, uh, as they say in What About Bob? New Hampshire? We were just talking about What About Bob. It is, it is a really good movie. <laughs> it's my favorite. I watch it like every year. <laughs> you don't watch What I, About Bob. I do Bob. actually watch it like every year. Every year? year? Yeah. What's your favorite moment from What About Bob? Um, the part where he's doing the, the interview uh, and Bob's just like chilling and steals the entire show from the... And the family... Of, the, whole, the whole movie is hilarious with the family like backing Bob, no, right? No, but, it's, it's the dinner scene where he's just like taking a bite of food and, and, he, going, and he goes... Mm, 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 <laughs> yeah. Mm, that, that part is really That just, is the best part that, of that movie. That part yeah. might be the best part. Also, or, or I'm sailing. And he's like strapped to the mast. Yeah. That, that, oh, what a punchline. A hell of a, I'm saying a punchline. <laughs> also, I really like uh, Richard Dreyfuss' performance when he's trying to wake him up. He's like, Bob, Bob, <laughs> rise and shine. And he goes, cock a doo doo <laughs> as Richard Dreyfuss, and it's very good. And then, of it course, is. the joke is that the alarm goes off, and then he wakes up immediately. Right. I remember that. Also, like, when uh, Richard Dreyfuss comes in and storms into the room because he's making too much noise with his son Siggy and they're not going to sleep yes and he goes all I want is some peace and quiet and Siggy goes uh, I'll be quiet and then Bob Bill Murray says I'll be peace that blew my mind as a kid 
Anyway, so yeah, this question was just about what about Bob? Um, <laughs> no, Corey from New Hampshire writes, Hello, crew. Uh, I've been playing Pyre and came across the moment when the minstrel plays a song for your group. I love Supergiant games for these intimate, intimate moments in their games. With the success of Pyre, does it look like Supergiant can do wrong? Or better yet, what can Supergiant do better to solidify their rank as one of the best indie studios out there? Oof. Should I ask Greg Kasavin this? Yeah, this last is tough. For, uh, I, mean, I, I still haven't played Pyre, so it's tough. For yeah, me. I haven't played Pu- either. Plug that, Hanson. You talked. To, you talked to him on last week's uh, last week's podcast, right? Like yeah, a, yeah, like a whole interview with him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is. I, someone else wrote in. I uh, really appreciate it, like calling out a specific thing where I was trying to come up with like one unifying word between their games. And I, I, in the interview last week, I told Greg this: like the best word I can come up with is confident. Like those games are so bold and so confident and distinct. Um, I think they're already out there as like if you want one of the most unique experiences just wait for the next super giant game um but the part that really caught my attention here is uh talking about uh, there's a moment where the minstrel sings a song in the game and jared one of game informers interns that we'll have on the show uh, in the future he wrote a song or wrote a feature recently about all like songs within games it's surprisingly common especially in the last five years or so to have like a character within the game sing a song Obviously, I can go back to the roots of Final Fantasy VI and the opera, maybe like the first notable example. But hmm. it is strange when you start thinking about it, like in Tacoma, uh, mm-hmm. there's a sequence where someone sings a song. And even yeah. like in the AAA space, like Bioshock Infinite, I guess, at the end. The circle. Will the yeah. Circle be yeah. yeah. Uh, was, was there one of that in The Last of Us or is that just the trailer for Last the of Us The trailer two? part two. Okay. Yeah, because at the end, yeah, he's going to teach Ellie how to play the guitar, right? Yeah, and then yeah. that's, the, that's the pickup there. Or even Beyond Two Souls. Uh, the classic oh. game uh, she sings oh, the Beck yeah, song yeah. Yeah. in the snow mm-hmm. it's a weird way just to it does work though it makes you more attached to a character because at true. least back in the yeah. day by that I mean five years ago or so it was like oh I've never really seen a character just sing a full song and okay so it's not a c- actually in-game character singing but to use music as a real set piece you've got the ladder in Metal Gear Solid 3 of course which is a little known fact though if you rotate the camera around you can actually see Big Boss singing it's actually his mouth is moving <laughs> snake eater he's gotta entertain himself somehow I wish you'd do like a little Luigi's Mansion thing where he sings along with the soundtrack that was so good uh, someone named Nail writes in and says hey GI crew oh I'm sorry his name isn't Nail that's a username uh, hey GI crew Josh here from Indiana don't call me Nail um, I, ju- <laughs> I just watched the recent PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds live stream with Dan and Ben and there are a few times where they talked about becoming more connected and building their bond. I think that was the core of the stream. If that I was, that was all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, made me wa- it. it made me wonder, does Dan Tax complete and utter refusal to ever share anything personal about himself make it hard to become friends with him? Or is Dan a lot more open <laughs> off camera? I, I don't... Ref- yeah, uh, I'd say that I am. And I'd say some of the questions that you ask on, on stream are simply inappropriate for... I, I'm trying to poke at you a little bit. I understand bit. that. I'm trying to tear down the wall between so us. So like, if you want to know like stuff that... I'm perfectly willing to talk about a lot of personal topics. You're a guarded like, guy off camera, though. No, I, I don't know about that. Really? I'd say you're like, not cagey off camera. Don't think so. I think Dan, you are. That's my interpretation of myself. No, I mean, I think that, I think it's other parts of Dan's personality that make him hard to be friends with. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Man. <laughs> I, and this I, is a merciless crew, you know. That's why. That's I, why I, you wonder why I'm guarded. It is true. I think. I think the way you present yourself on camera is 99 percent the way you present yourself. I think yourself you're off pretty camera. much sure. the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Well, there's the answer then. There we go. But we're guarded. not asking you a bunch of like weirdo questions. Han- yeah, that's just right. handsome. Look, and we have like two hours to kill in a PUBG stream <laughs> as we're crawling around because Dan won't go in and get some action. He's too busy. <laughs> what? Hiding out. Spider over here. Wait a minute. Are you are Wait you accusing Dan minute. of it? Okay, yeah. come on. It's uh, someone named Chules writes in and says, Praise Dan Tech, the sun god. Uh, also says, I've noticed that when Shadow of War is brought up, someone usually asks why other developers haven't incorporated the Nemesis system into their games. Could it be that the Nemesis system isn't as great as everyone thinks it is? Uh, I thought it was a neat idea at first, but then quickly it wore off after more than one of my rivals kept coming back to mess with me after repeatedly chopping off their heads. Turning enemies into allies started great as well, but it was 50-50 on whether they get slaughtered in seconds or overpower everyone and render me useless, a.k.a. making the game too much of a breeze. Anyone else, anyone else have this problem? This brings me back to, you know, you talked about Kingsway earlier, you know, cute gimmick. And I think that's what that that's what that is. And it, it certainly overstates welcome for me. It's It's a neat thing, but like, uh, when you, when people talk about that game, they like use that as the crux of like why the game is so good. And yeah, I don't see that at all. I think it's man. I I enjoy it. It's different. I still think when people talk about it and remember Shadow of Mordor, I think it's a little bit of the 
the idea of the nemesis system is more captivating than if you broke it down mechanically, like what was actually going on in that game. Yeah. I mean, a, a few things. One being what he, what, or, or she, Chules. 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 Um, like the fact that, like, I get it if it's like, I stab him and kick him off a cliff and who knows what happened to him. But like when I see, when I chop the head off yeah. and then to see them come back later, it's just like, why? I don't get why, why is that? That's a thing. <laughs> yeah. And like, so, to an- like a more specific answer is like I, th- I think the Nemesis system is a great idea that more that more developers can like take and play with. Yeah. But I think its implementation in Shadow of War, its sort of like you know inaugural outing, had a lot of problems, and I think that's part of where the surprise comes from. It's this idea that shows so much potential. Yeah. And yeah. I'm surprised that no one else sort of took that and iterated on it. Because like, God, I still remember how disappointed I was at the end of that game when it's like I had one nemesis that I was sort of like was like my, my nemesis for most of the game. But then in the final like hour or something, someone else became my nemesis, some random guy. And then like, oh, that's who is like up at the castle at the end. It's like, I have no connection to that. Like, I, you know, I don't know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, the why are, are, are we enemies or not? So like. <laughs> Of all, so all, all that being said, I think that there, I think that there's so much you could do with that, and that's what people latch onto. Yeah. But I think absolutely, it is not as good as everyone rem- remembers it being in uh, Shadow of Mordor. Very curious about Shadow of War. Yeah. It seems like they're making it a lot more complicated. And I, uh, I don't know. I'm curious if the Nemesis system will shine through with that game. Is be like ah, now they perfected it. This is what we wanted. Um, Dylan writes in says. Uh, has a coworker's review of a game that is poor or even just average made you pass on a game? One example is the most recent Hitman game where Jeff Holm gave it an average score. I think it's seven exactly. But recently on Twitter, I've seen JV go back to it and enjoy it. I was just wondering, to what level does a coworker's review make you want to play a game or pass on it? With very few exceptions, I don't play anything under a GI-8. Which is weird. Aww, really? Yeah, that's usually my bar. Okay. What if? What if we give a game... Maybe like Firewatch is a good example. I think Cork gave it like a seven seven five, right? But mm-hmm. the seems like the rest of the industry really liked it, and it was talked about yeah. as one of the best. Yeah, games like of I said, year. with few exceptions. Like, okay. I think part of one thing to consider with this. I'm sorry, Elise, you do. No, you you go ahead first. I, I think with anything or like a review is ultimately just someone's opinion on something, yeah, right? Yeah, that's. So with anything, it depend. It's not just what GI gave it; it's who gave it what. Yeah. You know, so like in the case of Jeff Cork and, and Firewatch, like I read his review, saw the score, but like as any review, it's more than just a score. It's the text. And when you read the text and you see like, oh, these are the things Jeff thought this game did well. They'll sound like things I would like. Mm-hmm. I ended up I ended up playing Firewatch. Right. You know, whereas like no matter what's, you know, no matter what score someone gives the next. I, I don't know. I, I, it it, it uh, depends. Like. <laughs> If it was a game that I was already interested in checking out and, like, the concept seemed really interesting to me, I would probably play it anyway. I'm trying to remember the name of this game, but uh, I think Cork reviewed it. It was some, like, police simulator. Gosh. I think it's just called This is the Police. This is the Police. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm brilliant. Uh, uh-huh. No, anyway, it's it's uh, I, I, I played it, and it has, like, some themes that are a little bit troubling but like the experience as a whole was like kind of cool i liked it and he gave it like a four. Oh, really yeah <laughs> so i don't know that's odd it you yeah. guys i hate it when you review games at home because i always like being able to walk around the office and then just have like a row of monitors like what is this is this fun but it's so fun like it makes it so much more difficult sometimes. Oh, I, I yeah, know. Like trust sitting me. in between the jeffs like if they're reviewing anything <laughs> it's like four times a day someone will come up and just say, hey, what do you think of this? And then I have to hear him go through the same speech again and again and again and again and again. Uh, but still worth it. So you guys should just keep reviewing games in the office, please. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Dan? No. Just play yeah. all of Final Fantasy XIV's expansion oh, in the office, please. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Did you get through that, by the way? Uh, yes. Yes. It was a beast. Yeah. It, you can check out the new Massive in the issue uh, coming up soon. There we go. Looking forward to it. Michael from Roseville, Minnesota says, do any of you guys have game-themed artwork at home? Any suggestions for where to find nice gaming-related art that isn't too tacky or obvious? Sure. I have a ton in my house. Uh, much of it is from Gibbs Rainrock, a.k.a. Crow Smack. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, uh, okay. Hang on, coming up swinging. Okay, slow down. What you... Wow, wow, wow. Okay, what is it? Is this an Etsy guy? What is uh, this? Yeah, yeah. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, What's the name? He does game art, specifically Dark Souls and Bloodborne-related artwork. 
Mm. So your your home, which I imagine is just a bloodborne esque mansion, of course, it's just it's, covered. It's, quite, <laughs> it's cut out of rock, stone, blood, uh-huh. and water. Yeah. Have you ever invited anybody to your place? Absolutely. Who's been over there? I don't know. Has a single game former editor ever walked through those doors? Uh, nope. Why is that? Hey, I got a small place. He says he's not guarded. He's literally walled himself <laughs> off, ladies and gentlemen. Right. He won't have it. But apparently, we see a lot of cool Dark Souls art inside. Yes. I'll be damned. That's neat. Uh, as far as good places, uh, just search for stuff on Etsy, I guess. I don't know. Like, I have a very dumb piece of art at home, which I really like. Uh, a good friend of mine who uh, is a little nutso, he painted or he drew uh, just the mask from Majora's Mask. And then drew like a bunch of naked people in an office all wearing Majora's mask. It's nuts. Uh, and I, I framed it and I have it on my wall. And I huh. really, really love it. So I have a nutso friend who's a good artist, I think is a recommendation. Can I answer for a couple other editors? Please. I know Andy McNamara has a super awesome framed print of, again, Metal Gear Solid 3. That like the Yoji Shinkawa, like the tree with... So, like solid snake yeah. and, or uh, big boss and like the boss coming off of oh, it and stuff, wow. nice. which is like that is super awesome so be the editor in chief of Game Informer to get some good stuff uh, Jeff Cork <laughs> has that old leisure suit Larry uh, picture this um, needs more of an explanation. There's a pixelated naked lady <laughs> in the I original. I didn't know how in depth oh I, I didn't oh, know that I wanted to say Jeff Cork has a naked lady. Well, it up doesn't and... even count because it's pixel naked. Okay. But it's the original Leisure Suit Larry, and he did something awesome, which is took that pixel art, blew it up so it's a giant painting on his wall, but then mapped it out accurately to the pixels. So, like, to even recognize that it's a naked lady, you need to be standing back and squinting. And he has like a couple of kids, but I don't think they see it as like a naked lady painting because it's just like 14 squares. You know, you can't even make sense of it. Yeah. But it's secretly hardcore pornography and someday they'll learn that. Someday. Uh, yeah. Uh, Forrest Lastman from Lawrence says, hi. Hello. In last week's podcast, Imran Khan talked about... I got to get used to that name. All right. Imran Khan, mm-hmm. our coworker, Imran Khan, him. talked about listening to financial calls for fun. I've done the same thing and I will defend financial results as interesting. Cool. Uh, what kind of seemingly boring, non-essential work do you enjoy doing and why? This could be everything from looking at financials to researching older forgotten games to learning how a mechanic is programmed. Uh, for me, it's a, it's making images for the site, like making the thumbnail for this podcast. Just cropping mm. images? That's a huge, no, not even cropping, <laughs> but like rearranging, finding like, okay, we can't just go for the box art. Everyone's going to see that. Like, what is the deepest cut? Can I pause a trailer at a certain point to grab a still so it'll stand out compared to everybody else's? Uh, I make way too many images every week for the podcast. And it's just like a good time to listen to other podcasts and just Photoshop stuff together. Hmm. I'm really, really into it. Hmm. That's my thrill. Sometimes, cool. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Usually, I don't like transcribing, but there are some days when I actually just kind of just get in the zone. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm cool with doing this all day. Really? Yeah. Just because it's a specific task. I think it's yeah, it's a very specific thing, and it's kind of like methodical, and you just you get into your own thoughts, and you're just very focused. On People something. may not realize how much of the job that is is recording audio interviews with developers and then sitting down and typing out but every I, word that I can also get tired of it quite yeah. quickly. Oh, yeah. So especially depends. especially for cover stories and like mm-hmm. the features oh. associated with that. Where it's two days of yeah, talking to everybody in the studio. Really and now, and everyone on staff does a fair bit of like editing, you know, features and stuff before they go online. But like I, I try to read every review that goes up on oh, the site. Oh, yeah. Um, which, I, which I enjoy. Some people might find it boring to edit a bunch of reviews. That sounds miserable. That's what I Who's do. your favorite review writer on staff? I'm not going to say that. Anything Is that right? Do you have one? God, that's not okay. you look forward that's to not the okay reviews? To ask. He's so really? guarded. He's yeah. so guarded. Oh. Leo's my favorite video guy. <laughs> no one's no one's been to my house either. Well, that's <laughs> not true. Actually, typical handsome, have. typical handsome like gotcha. Got yeah. You know? right, thanks. Yeah. Gotcha journalism. That's, that's Who's nice. your favorite we and have, why? We have a lot of strong writers on staff. All right. Who's the weakest? No. Nope. Okay. Anyways, uh, Chris Stillwell from Pleasant Hill, Missouri says, Hello, GI Show. I'm 21. I've been working two jobs. I listen to the show on my commute. Lately, I've noticed that when I'm at work, all I can think about is getting home and putting hours into Pillars of Eternity, Pyre, Overwatch, or so many other games. But when I actually am home or have time off, I find myself electing to just watch a show or do something else instead. The cycle has continued for many months. My question is, have any of you ever fell into a rut like this where you just don't want to play games, you just want to watch a show instead? Uh, you know, specifically for me, I, you wouldn't really get that luxury, right? Like, uh, you have to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
so no. <laughs> <laughs> I always find the thing was like, oh, I should go through another playthrough of Nier Automata. But Larry Sanders, it's like a 20 minute episode. I could just bang that out instead. No, so that's, if you want to watch like a, a light show at the same time, that's when you grab the, the CCG or the MMRPG mm. and then you want the two screens. Beautiful. Right. What a life. I, so <laughs> yeah, it's great. That does that does happen to me actually, and it usually happens after I've played a very long game. It takes a, it takes a while for me to get back into something. So yeah. like, there was that stretch earlier this year where I played like Near Automata, Mass Effect, Persona Five, just sort of like all very close together. And I'd say there was a couple of weeks. I mean, I was still playing games for work during work, but mm-hmm. like like after that, when I got home. There was stuff like Breath of the Wild had come out and it's like, hey, you should play Horizon had come out. I only just beat Horizon. You know, like I I just was not didn't have the mental bandwidth to play something else at home. I, I ended up re like starting to, a rewatch of The Office. Right. I you know, know I've course. been there too. So naturally. Yeah. Uh, Tyler from Virginia has a simple question. Do you guys ever get annoyed in games when you have your character walk five to ten steps and then it starts a cutscene? What was the point of taking control for that little moment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's annoying. I think, I, I think it's dumb. Mm-hmm. Cutscenes are dumb. I'm with it. No, not that cutscenes are dumb. Sometimes they work, and mm-hmm. some games are not great. But yeah, I, I, I know we complete what he's talking about. It's just like here's your character for three seconds after you finish one cutscene, and then you walk four steps, and the other cutscene starts. I right? feel like that it's, was a bulk of our Pokemon Sun and Moon conversation at the game club. Uh, was oh my god. No, honestly, let that, me walk more. Those than games one alley. are horrible about it, man. Yeah. Like you go from, hey, I'm here. Up, oh, cutscene, 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 cutscene. Well, especially Pokemon Sun and Moon, because it's literally like I think it's highlighted on the map down below, right? It like, tells hey, you where your here, quest here. markers are. Yeah, I yeah, feel yeah. like the last, not Breath of the Wild, but the one before that, Skyward Sword. Sword. Yeah. I feel like that one did that a lot too. At least in the in the opening, part it was a lot of, of fee just guiding you, the little yeah. guidance character. But yeah, it was brutal. Um, Trey Parker calls those games cutscene hunters. Uh, in an interview with really... the Nerdist, he talked about how he hates cutscene hunter games. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, and how he insists that South Park games cannot be cutscene. Well, hopefully we get one of those South Park games pretty soon. Here. Boy, wouldn't that be sweet? <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to that for a hop, skip, and a jump. You're talking about that mobile one, right? Oh, definitely. Okay, Phone cool. destroyer. Yeah, me, there we go. Give me that one. <laughs> Aiden Hanlon from Columbus, Ohio says, good morning, crew. Good morning, Aiden. Uh, for some super odd reason, all developers, publishers, this is true, by the way. He says, for some super odd reason, all developers, publishers, rights holders, etc., have suddenly lost all their IP rights over everything they owned. Oh, did you hear about this? Uh, this is a very interesting. Yeah, I did. I, everyone has. <laughs> I think we wrote a story. Yeah. It's on the news. Yeah, it's on the news. Uh, <laughs> three new companies have hired each of you on the show today to represent them in a new video game intellectual property rights off. It's a draft. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you all now get to take turns drafting franchises or IPs that you'd love to have your company work on. Let's okay. assume all have equally talented developers, artists, etc. Do you go for franchises like Call of Duty, right. which you know will make money, or focus on reviving Long Dead series to want to see them brought back to life? Yeah, well, who gets to go first? This is the draft. Yeah. Um, uh, Elise, you want to go first? Uh, so which IP I would want to yeah. own, basically? Everything's up for grabs. Yep. Absolutely Every everything's day? up for grabs. Everything. What do you want? Good Lord, I'd probably go with Mass Effect. Okay, so Elise has okay. Mass Effect. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, next up, I don't know how sports drafts work. Dan, do you ever watch those? Yeah, I do. Is there a formatting that we should mimic here? Uh, basically, the first person who went first round doesn't go first in the next two rounds. Everybody gets a first pick. Basically. So you're saying they just go clockwise? For one thing, we would have rolled <laughs> off. We would have rolled off because I'm sure me and Joe uh-huh. have the same first pick, and that's really bothersome to me. And Elise, <laughs> I think in last season she was the lowest scored IP, so right. that's why she got to go first this time. This isn't. We didn't. Obviously, we're not holding to any kind of standard here. <laughs> uh-huh. so, just, so just pick who's ever next. Uh, hey, Joe, what game do you want to own? You know what? I'll I'll let Dan. I'll let Dan take uh, take the one I was thinking of. I'll take uh, Metal Gear Solid <gasps> for a couple reasons. Uh, one, I I love that series. For another, I would, what I would love to do is just keep Konami from screwing it up. Mm-hmm. So it's like by taking ownership <laughs> of it, I can. And, like, maybe I'm not going to profit off of it, but I can at least protect it. Right. Right. Uh, but so. would that involve, going back to the old conversation that the YouTube channel loves, would you then nuke Metal Gear Survive if you owned it and that game was coming out and you could press that button? <laughs> but we just... Oh, man, this I mean, you know, is crazy. Uh, yeah. And, all right, all right. and also, because, because like, I don't know how we're going to cover that game in the future. I don't want it. I don't want to set up something that's like, hey, Joe hate, hated that game from the all beginning right. or whatever. So there we go. Yeah, uh, so. My number one, Pokemon. Let's focus that thing down. <laughs> <It's> spread out. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Uh, 
free form exploration. Really oh, embrace boy. more of an open design for Pokemon. Get that story out of there. Okay. Dan, what do you want? I'll take Final Fantasy. Oh. And I'm bringing it back. Ooh, All right. We're doing mean? job systems. We're doing ATB. We're going to go, we're going to we, make a pixelated one. Crystal comes we, back. Oh, so we're doing 16 bit? We're going to do a 16 bit one. But this, right. there's still going to be the main line, but we're doing a 16 bit one. Like on the Dimensions side. 2? Is it going to be mobile and split into four chapters? <laughs> no. We're going to, you know what? The mobile division, <laughs> I'm going to take them in a little cart and just dump them right out in the ocean. And then oh, we're going straight you're gonna back. You're going to drown those developers? <laughs> no, they can swim. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's nice. Elise, round two. <laughs> hey, no, 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 no. She went first last time. Now it has to go. Correct. Uh, it it would goes be, in reverse. I don't understand your sports rules. Okay, Can fine. we just go around in Whatever. a circle? Elise gets to go next. Thank All you. Right. I'm okay. Uh, pff, good lord. Uh, I need to think. Um, I would go with. Jesus, why that can't... Tacoma IP is sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ready to take. I don't know, guys. It's ripe right. for the ignoring. Are you let's, passing? Let's, let's, no, no, I'm not. Let's change it up then. We'll give her some time to yeah, think. Yeah, let me think. All right. Okay. I my next one would be I take this for the sole purpose of reviving it and bringing it back, mm-hmm. and I feel like I've talked about this on the show several times. But I want I want Valkyrie Profile back. Uh, I just restarted Valkyrie Profile, the first one on PS One. Yeah, uh, over the weekend because like it, I don't know. I've talked about why why I like this game so much. It's a it's a great RPG, a lot of depth. That Triace has sort of lost their footing in recent years, and I think. Getting back to what that first, and, well, and the second one. Is so you like too. Valkyrie Profile and Valkyria Chronicles? Yeah, hey, Gun Valkyrie is that a game as well? Do you like that? You're going to take my next pick, man. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, number two, we'll go okay, Sunset okay. Riders. Uh, Ooh, on my, sorry, so we're doing all the, all the let's revive that old baby. IPs now. Yeah, okay. let's let's okay. get some weird neon cowboys all back right. in town. Elise, you ready? Wait, was, wait, what are we doing now? Something's changed. No, or no, I'm, no. Oh, no. Okay, no, we're so. still just naming games. <laughs> <laughs> it's still just IPs that All you All right. Want. Well, I have The Last of Us. Oh. Okay. Okay. Just grabbing it I, from Neil Druckmann's dirty hands. I think that would be a pretty great IP to have. Just to, like, make more whimsical and fun? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would do? I would probably make more um, uh, kind of same DLC that they had. Like, just more bite-sized stories? I would love more oh, of that. Yeah. yeah, that would be good. More squirt guns. Dan Tech? Um, let's go with uh, Shining Force. Let's bring that oh, back. Okay. Let's make okay. it good. Okay. Let's make Shining Force great again. Okay. I think, especially with the modern success of like the Fire Emblem games, I think a Shining Force game stands to, to benefit from that success now more than ever. It needs and an awakening. That series needs to come back and not be a mobile piece of crap. Mm. And, and, <laughs> you know. So let's do that. There let's take Shining Force and, and do that. At least you want to go again, or Joe? Should uh, we go right to I you? Got, I got something. Hit it. Earthbound. Oh, great! Yeah, that would be super fun to make like a modern Earthbound. Would you make it sixteen bit? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, no, I think it would be kind of cool to like modernize it a bit. And plus, with all the IPs you know, you can finally and make that Last of Us make Earthbound sure it's crossover. Still as quirky as hell. <laughs> yeah, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Joe. Uh, I think I'd go with something a little more modern on this one. I know Elise already has Mass Effect. I'd I'd take Dragon Age. Okay. I, okay. I know that. I know that. That's. I was also thinking about that. I know Inquisition is a divisive game in our office, but uh, I like that is one of my favorite RPGs. And you would like to shepherd it. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, uh, Inquisitor. It. Inquisitor. <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd also take Valkyria Chronicles. That doesn't do count. That. I'm sorry. No, can't no, no. That. that doesn't count. That nope, doesn't count. I've got it. That's uh, my fourth pick. This, this is a confusing rights ones. I would take uh, the Lego games uh, just so I can make my Lego Old Testament game once and for all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a gold mine waiting to heaven. I see. Dan Tech? Uh, I will take Warcraft. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. I can yeah. make a lot of money and have some fun. So. Comma, World of? You know what? I think we're going to we'll put World out to pasture and do something neat. Oh do something different with it. Mm, something uh, different yeah. like an adventure game a MOBA god no 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 MOBAs <laughs> no more no MOBAs no CCGs and no uh, battlegrounds alright so we're not doing any of those oh, oh Warcraft gonna, battlegrounds would be so good I have an idea for a free to play survival game oh, yeah. starring Tristan. Warcraft characters it's genius <laughs> You're Everybody lands on an island and you all have a hatchet and you're either an orc or a human and yeah, you build see, up. Oh, gosh. There you go. Innovation. Yeah, we're not doing uh, that. Coming to early access <laughs> in about a year on Steam, by the way. You didn't you, you didn't just say, I want to make an RTS again. No, we're definitely not making an RTS. What would you do with it, Hotshot? Um, I'm thinking something. It's going to be it's gonna be an MMO. What? It's, it's, it's going to be an MMO. It's just okay. not going to be the traditional 
um, tab targeting MMO. We're going to do something cool with it. I don't know. Let me guess. An action-focused combat MMO. It'll be action combat. Okay. Um, all right. But it's not going to be like, you know, all the MMOs right now. It's like, hey, we've got action. Yeah, everybody does now. So but this think, would be the next World of Warcraft for World of Warcraft, right? Like, we're I going next I think you also gen. argued in an earlier episode of the podcast that World of Warcraft 2 would just be a more action-focused MMO. So isn't Blizzard no, handling this on I their didn't, own? I never, did not argue that. Uh, I argue that there would be, you know, the the essential graphical upgrade that will happen eventually. Th- there will definitely be World of Warcraft 2 someday. You and, know that. And let's also clarify that Dan isn't making this game. He's just having the I right just, to do That's right. He and has, guess what? He's right. the fat cat. Since I have the IP, yeah. we're also going to make a good movie. So, oh, boom. Oh, nice. I'm getting, the Co- I'm getting the Coen brothers to do it. That works. I still <laughs> am fascinated by when Blizzard announced they're making that movie. They did like a lot of interviews where it's like, sure. we're making a good one. Like that was like their only talking. But what were they going to say? You know, good movies like Godfather, Citizen Kane. We're making one of those types of movies. They said that because of the stigma between behind video games. Of course, but it's just it's a weird marketing message for the first beat of a movie to be like, this one's going to be good, you guys. And and everyone loved it. Yeah, (laughs) we sure did. I couldn't do it. (laughs) But Duncan Jones, friend of the show, he's on the podcast. Love it. Um. Anyways, favorite question? What do you guys like? Uh, I like the New oh. Hampshire What About Bob. Uh, <laughs> but they did not know they were triggering a What About Bob. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, it doesn't matter. Because no. then we talked about I like the hypothetical IP one. Yeah. That, was, the IP really, one was, that one was off the wall. And I haven't heard a question like that on here. Yeah, so. no, I haven't cool. either. I know it's usually like, don't give it to the last question because that's just the one fresh in your mind. But right. that's a, that one really. That was like, actually the most creative. It created question. a really cool yeah. table discussion. Got the old noggin yeah. cooking. I, as far as something different, I like the picking up an old game thing too. I like the just. Hey, Switch is the next hey, console. We had a lot debate. of good questions this this you time. Did. There's yeah, no yeah, doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt. The music thing. Are we all right? If two people are leaning IP, I I'm can lean IP. IP. Mm. I think so. Joe, can you? Joe doesn't lean want IP. To lean no, IP. I'm fine. hard against. Okay, but, he's you hard know, against. we don't need. We, it doesn't need to be unanimous. You can go against me. That's right. And Joe, you can. What's you the can, other contender? You can celebrate Corey from New Hampshire for uh, the song stuff. Wait, the what about talking Bob about super giant games? Yeah, the accidental what about Bob email. Yeah. But let's go IP. That's a, that's a thorough, fun, fun yeah, idea. So, I think so Aiden Hanlon, we'll ship you out something real nice. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, for now, stay tuned. We're going to be talking to Brett Duville. This podcast ain't over, folks. All about LucasArts. Uh, back of the day, George Lucas talking about Todd Howard, all the greats. We're talking about Skyrim's development. Then we're talking about switching over to Tacoma. Uh, he's a wise man. so And also a programmer, which is pretty rare for an interview. So listen to this. Brett Duville, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Thank you very much. Nice yeah, it's an honor to have you. Uh, you seem like a guy who's very interested in art, creativity, trying to understand the industry. Uh, you post a lot on your blog. You have the Dev Game Club podcast trying to dissect everybody else's work. And I want this yes. interview to kind of to be a mirror that we turn back on you because no one's reflecting on your work in the industry, <laughs> man. Uh, well, that's that's great. Uh yeah, uh, reflections are real time these days, so I guess that's cool. <laughs> so, with all your work, I mean, you post so much on your blog, Dev Game Club. I don't know how the hell you and Tim Longo over there are playing so many games and finding the time. What, uh, just broadly speaking, what are you trying to get to the bottom of? What are you trying to learn by doing that? I mean, it's two things for us. I mean, one is just an opportunity. Tim and I have been working, we worked together for seven years at LucasArts. Uh, most of the time we were there. And, you know, I shipped three games with him. So, We've been friends for, you know, coming on 20 years now. So part of it is just to have an opportunity to discuss games, period. And we tried to find a way to find a niche that maybe wasn't being covered. So it's really a twofold thing. One is to be an opportunity for us to talk together, which we don't get nearly enough time to do. And the other is to sort of provide kind of a dev view into a sort of book club type books. So you're not... You know, you're you're often reading the classics in a book club, for example, and we're trying to basically read the classics, as it were, in, in video games. And we try to find things that are still certainly still playable, whether it's in emulation or on various machines and things like that. But it is the biggest thing is to find those lessons that those things were establishing and how they sort of directed the industry for good or ill. Uh, over the years that, that followed. so Have you noticed that you've learned something concrete from it in your work on either Tacoma or Tim's work on Halo 5 or other things where it's like, ah, you know what? Going back to Warcraft 1 really reminded <laughs> us that this aspect's important. Well, I, I mean, one of the ones that Tim brings up all the time is uh, Zelda as, you know, the sort of, the, the loop of 
getting an item that lets you reach an area you couldn't before or that enables a new way to view the space that you've been using. He, he uses that all the time. You know, that's a, we need this thing. We had an amusing exchange, which was all about things. Well, we need a Zelda thing to get the thing so we can do the thing. And, you know, <laughs> you know Zelda and, things. Exactly. Right. You know, just things. So that's one of the concrete examples that I think we, we pull forward for me, you know, as a more technical guy, there's not necessarily going to be a lot I can draw from. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of gameplay programming lately. I'm more a systems programmer in the last 10 years or whatever. And just because I've been doing it so long, that's what they want to pay me to do. But so a lot of the, the sort of system level knowledge is, I mean, this hardware is all old and dead for the most part. And it's, it's hard to take specific lessons from that. Uh, but I mean, it's not impossible. And so you, you keep an eye out. Um, yeah. so I wouldn't say day to day it's influenced my work on anything in particular. Sure. One of the most interesting parts of the podcast, uh, from what I've listened to so far is I love the Final Fantasy nine discussion as you guys did a mm -hmm. little while ago. And I, I reference it all the time, but I loved hearing Tim, especially just trying to wrap his mind around like how many game engines are happening here? Like, how is everything so handcrafted? What right. were those Japanese developers thinking it's amazing but how did they pull it off this way uh and even like i think polygon wrote an oral history of final 7 recently and i guess that game had five different game engines running in it uh mm -hmm. are there other little quirks that have stood out to you that you're just stunned going back to these games about how the developers pulled it off yeah i mean everyone has has different things that are just amazing to me and one of the things that has come up a lot has been the ways in which for example a speedrunning community has found workarounds with different games, you know, whether it's Super Metroid or now we're doing Super Mario World. And there are just some really amazing exploits to these games that we, as developers, we don't necessarily know that those things are coming. I mean, I, I picked on Tim a little bit about Halo 1. I mean, sometimes you leave those things in there, the Warthog launching and things like that, those weird physics bugs that those things had. Um, you look at that stuff and you're just like, wow, I had no idea. And for me, it also just points out it's impossible to bulletproof a game. There, It's just not, it's never going to happen. <laughs> you know, you're, you're dealing with these limited machines that they're going to find a way to, you, somebody will find a way to break what you did. And I, I mean, those even, things are extraordinary to me. Even from the outside perspective, at least, it always seems like Nintendo has the most locked down bulletproof games. But I think the speedrunning community alone has shown like, I don't know, you can still crack through that armor. Right. If you just go backwards and jump up and do butt stomps on the photo on the wall in Mario 64, of course, you'll just go through and teleport. <laughs> and you're like, how is this? How do you even find that? You know? Yeah. Um, so it is. I mean, things like that come up all the time. The Final Fantasy IX one is a good example as well, because. I remember playing that the first time, and I always watch the credits on games all the, all the way through. I feel like that's, you know, it's worth giving creators their due. And I remember with those games seeing, you know, such and such programmer, like combat and combat game programmer, and or combat program. Uh, I can't remember how they say it, you know, how they translate it from Japanese. But it's basically like this person wrote this program, and this person wrote this program. And on the PlayStation 1, they could kind of load in different programs very quickly because you only had to fill two meg of, of RAM. So you could load the actual, a different program executable and, uh, and run that stuff. So it is, it is really interesting the things that you can kind of pick up by examining that. But yeah, it's, you know, you get a different one for the overworld you get a different one for combat you get a different one for the dungeons. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. It's just, it's more stitched together than any player would ever realize. Like, Oh, what do you oh, mean? It's yeah, just the no overall way. Final Fantasy VII experience, but no, it's, it's just a mess under the hood. It's a handful of experiences uh, stitched together and data is passed from one to the next. It's amazing. So being such a technical guy, um, are you able to sit back and enjoy these classic games or even modern games? Or are you always thinking about what's going on under the seams here? I, I do definitely pick at things and, and I try to understand how they're made and sort of the circumstances in which they're made. And I, I like to bring that at least in one of the episodes of the podcast and talk about okay, this hardware could do these things. You know, with the Super Metroid, we talked about the SNES, which had all this sort of um, image scaling and rotating of the backgrounds and things like that and, and these different modes for rendering. We talked about all that stuff. Even though I've never programmed that machine, it makes me really curious and wish I had a dev kit for, for that machine to, to play with, just out of curiosity of how to make it do that stuff. Um, because often when you're actually in it, you don't appreciate what you're dealing with. 
you know, I, I started on the, on the PlayStation 2, and that was a pain in the neck to program in many ways because it had multiple CPUs, you know, a graphics controller and then an input controller and then the main CPU. Um, and you had to use this thing called DMA, which I won't go into, to, to move stuff around. And they had these special sub-controllers. I mean, there's just – the hardware was nuts, and I had to ship a game. So my focus was I got to ship this game. And now looking back on it, not only do I feel like I have more tools now to have been better using that hardware just from my experience, but I also just think it would be more fun to program on, on that machine uh, now You know that I got some distance from it. You know, I, A year after I shipped my last PS2 game, which was Jedi Starfighter, I remembered – actually, I think it was more than a year. It might have been like five years. I, rem I like – woke up and was like, oh my God, we could totally do this. And I was still thinking about how to optimize the, <laughs> optimize that, that system, you know, you know, way, way after it was going to be any benefit to anybody. So even now, uh, are you waking up in the middle of the night thinking about PS2 architecture? Even now I wake up sometimes <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, if I could just have that back. <laughs> so looking back on your entire career, what, uh, what period do you find really fascinating that maybe people don't ask about or appreciate how fascinating it was? Well, for me, I mean, for me personally, I think my my favorite project in a lot of ways was Starfighter because it was my first. Oh, okay. I learned I learned so much, you know, in the course of a couple three years or whatever it was, um, in in so many different ways. I mean, it was my first job, so there's that. Um, so I was learning to work, you know, in the real world, as it were. I had been in grad school prior to that, so there's that. Um, you know, I was learning a ton about you know, programming for games. I mean, I learned a ton in grad school, but when you actually have to get out there and make a thing that has to go to people, uh, it's a totally different experience. Especially and, with that license. Yeah. And then the other thing too, is that I got to work with, it was my first time working with really creative people. I mean, it, you know, when you're siloed away in an engineering school, you're mostly working with other engineers and there is creativity in engineering, but it's a different sort of creativity than a designer has, for example, or an artist has. And it's nice to be exposed to those different things. But I mean, that's ultimately what attracted me to games was it, it engages both sides of my brain, right? The left side of the brain, you know, gets to go and do this stuff. The right side of the brain is going to do this other thing. And it's just a perfect marriage for me. And it's, it's something I've always sought, you know, in, in how I approach my life. It's just both, both the mathematical rigor or the sort of a logic, um, and then the the ability to explore a more creative, artistic side. So. Yeah. When did the sexiness of working with Star Wars wear off? Was there a certain point where we realized, like, oh, this is just a day-to-day -day job now, and I don't care that this is technically a starfighter? Well, in, in, in some ways it never did, and in other ways it really did. So I would say the things that drove us drove us crazy, and this was true of anybody, like we, we used to call Hayden Blackman, uh, who ended up being, I guess, the Force Unleashed project leader, he was uh, Star Wars Galaxy's point man for LucasArts, and then he went and did Mafia 3 most recently yeah. with uh, Hangar 13, I guess. Um, anyway, so so Hayden was, of course, in the building. I would play StarCraft with him at lunch, and we would call him, like, every other day with a stupid question about Star Wars. Like, hey, is there any safety feature on a lightsaber? Like, if you put that thing up against the side of your head and you turn it on, like, is, is it going to stop? And he would he would answer these questions in a serious way, like... He would go through what canon knows because he'd written the encyclopedia project, you know, right for episode done. one, yeah, yeah, for the episode one, um, you know, in that on that CD-ROM, and uh, and so he'd answer this fully blown, and at the end he'd say, "I hate Star Wars," and hang up, and he wouldn't, <laughs> like just you know, wouldn't even dignify the fact that we'd call. He'd just ramble and then hang up. Were you just uh, with him with these questions, or were they real oh, questions yeah, totally. for him? <laughs> yeah, we, didn't, we didn't need to know these things. We were just, you know. Well, what can we ask Hayden today? Um, <laughs> and uh, so that was great fun. And 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 so I, you never, we never kind of got bored with being in Star Wars from that standpoint. But on the other hand, we also had to work with the license and have it, have everything approved through the Lucasfilm licensing. And they weren't in the building, and they didn't really know us, and they didn't really know what we did. They didn't really understand games. You know, we had a meeting with them once over some some big project, something like Galaxies, um, and. You know, Lucasfilm licensing representatives were there, and they, it was clear they weren't people who played games. It was clear, I mean, they would throw, they were the sort of creative film people who are used to just like telling a team of special effects people make this thing happen. Yeah. And, you know, that's fine when it's going to be in a still image, you know, even a multiple still images, obviously, but you don't have to interact with it in any direct way. 
when that now has to be something that you could be at any point inside that 3D space, it's a totally different thing to make that run in, in real time and things like that. You would and, think someone that would be in charge of the Star Wars license would understand the concept of games. I mean, it's such, it's so, so Star Wars is so like entrenched in tech throughout its entire history. You think you need like a base level understanding of what the hell a game is, right? But it's all, you know, kind of broken down tech. I mean, I don't think people would really stand for the holograms of, of Leia. Like the quality of that, if our TVs look like that, we'd stop watching TV. <laughs> you know, it's all like broken down stuff. I mean, that's part of its charm, right? Is that sure. there's this ma magic stuff. And then there's all this kind of shambling, you know, remains of empire, you know, that, that, that have kind of gotten overgrown. I mean, I think that that's part of the appreciation of the zombie stuff that's so au courant, you know, has kind of been done to death in the last decade. Right. Is that this stuff that we know and see every day is breaking down, is falling apart, and and we're trying to make our way through it in sort of what remains. And yeah. I, I think that's a that's a really appealing kind of fantasy. And I think it it is part of the fantasy of Star Wars is that yes, there's all these these enormous starships and things like that, but they're all kind of break down and like the hyperspace doesn't work unless you bang on it like a jukebox. I mean, it's 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 relatable. It's, it's just, I think that's a, a very human experience of technology, especially in the 60s and 70s. Right. Yeah. You know? So and, what was a so what was the most frustrating conversation you had to have with somebody at Lucasfilm about video games? I, I mean, I didn't really have to do that all that much, but I do feel like the the craziest thing was for episode one, uh, because that was so secretive. There were posters everywhere in the in the uh, company, like with Darth Vader with a you know shh, loose lips <laughs> st sh starships. Um, so we were not supposed to talk, right? And of course, some somebody down in Hollywood somewhere leaked the script at some point and things like that. We had nothing to do with it. They never had to worry about the internals. But we had a room that was near the president's office where they had all the materials that we were allowed to have. So concept art. They had huge binders full of information and CD-ROMs and whatever. But no more than, I want to say, two people, maybe three people from a project could be in there at a time. And they couldn't be from different projects because they might see different things. And we had to do all these requests through a particular you know, administrative assistant who would actually get the stuff for, it, for us. So like that kind of bureaucracy around not letting any one person see too much was really limiting because... You know, a lot of the ships that we designed for Starfighter, for example, we just went with kind of, OK, well, there's this pirate gang because we didn't really have access to other materials that might have in influenced the the concept artists, for example. Yeah. You know, we didn't see the pod racers. I mean, it would have been kind of neat to have pod racing influence maybe on, um, you know, on the starships that we had, like multiple engine things that were chained. I mean, that would have been kind of a different sort of thing that nobody had seen before. And it would have fit with Star Wars. And we couldn't. We never found our way to that because we weren't exposed to the materials until far, until far too late. So oh, it was so frustrating. It's like we're on the same team. Like, why can't we align everything? Is that come from how much of that culture and philosophy comes from Lucas himself? Do you think? I I don't know. I mean, he's a very private private person, and and you know, for the most part, people didn't interact with him. You know, when on those few occasions when he would see him, he he very rarely came to Lucas Arts. Um, I, I think I was only ever in the same building with him once um, at, at, at LucasArts. I would go up to the ranch and have lunch on occasion. We'd do interviews up there sometimes for people who wanted to impress. And so he would sometimes be at lunch there. But in terms of actually coming to visit us, I mean, that was very rare. Yeah. Uh, only game I know that he looked of of mine was Republic Commando. And he gave us really good feedback, to be honest. And we felt like, boy, it would have been nice to have George commenting on other stuff. I, so What kind of feedback did he give you? Uh, we were, so it was right after E3, so it was very late because, of course, although we came out in April, February, February, April, something like that in 2005, we were actually done by, we were supposed to be done like that August of 2004, and it ended up being stretched out because of George's feedback into late, later, like December or you know, November or something like that, that we actually wrapped. But his feedback was the game is too serious and you couldn't distinguish any of the various commandos um, and that was because we had all had them voiced either by Tamura Morrison uh, who, who played Django in the film or uh, we had gotten sound alikes I and mean, we had already determined that the 
voice having tomorrow do all of the voices was not good because then you couldn't understand what was going on at all and who was speaking. Yeah. Uh, but all the all the characters were still white. If you go back and look at videos from that time, all the all the commandos have just pure white armor and they had no personality between them. And our argument was, well, look, they're clones. And he basically said, it doesn't matter. Do what you want. They're special clones if you want them to be. But they have to be individual. And there should be some humor. And he actually suggested we get Robin Williams to voice one of them, um, which wasn't going to happen ever because we didn't have that kind of budget. Did sure. he mean that? Or was it just like, you know, somebody like Robin Williams? No, it was like, no, get Robin Williams. <laughs> because he knew Robin. Um, you know, Robin was in Marin County. uh, uh you know, he lived. He lived in Marin County, and I. I think he and George were n- neighbors in the sense of living in the same town. Ross, I think. Um, so he had certainly met him, and and Robin Williams was a big fan of our work, and so was Spielberg. I mean, there were a lot of you know people in George's crowd that were aware of Lucas Arts. Um, anyway, we were like, well, we're not going to get the genie uh, to to voice uh, a Republic Commando, but we went and got Mike Stemley and Ryan Kaufman uh, to rewrite. A lot of the dialogue, we worked in a dialogue system that really made conversations happen um, and not replay them. Um, So that was a big deal. And through that and then just allowing it to have this kind of crime scene kind of humor come out of that, um, you know, just being these are the soldiers and soldiers talk and they have a lot of you know dark humor about what they're doing. And they're constantly doing impressions. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, they're constantly, you know, he's going to be Bogart one scene and, <laughs> uh, and then he's going to be Garbo and like nobody's going to understand that because it's a galaxy far away. But, come, you know, whatever. We gotta... <laughs> Why did Lucas's feedback come so late? I'd imagine that would just tear the team apart. Like if he just would have told us this during pre-production, we could have saved so yeah. many man hours. Yeah, it was it was very disruptive. And we did. I mean, we pushed back. Um, but we what what people always said about George is if he says something once, you can probably ignore it. Um, but if he says it a second time, then he really means it and it has to happen. And oh, uh, in our case, he said it a second time. And so it was a thing that we had to do. Um, we would have loved to have it earlier. I just think he was so focused on the prequels then, right? I mean, this would have been, you know, episode three hadn't come out yet. Um, episode two had. We were kind of, we were trying to bridge that gap a little yeah. bit with with, this, with that game. Um, I think at that point, he just, he started to take more of an active interest. And it might have been... It might have been in part because we were starting to look at merging and merging with ILM, and I can't remember the timeline exactly. But there was this this sense that the two the two businesses could inform one another. Our real time rendering expertise might help them pre visualize um, their storytelling and framing expertise might really help us. You know, artistically, there had been some sort of inroads there, like Bounty Hunter. Um, whatever you think of the game, the cutscenes in the story were very good. And, and that was largely because of an, an interaction with uh, ILM and, in, in getting that story told yeah. in, in those cutscenes, And, and so that was kind of the start of all that. And I think that might be why he started to take a more market interest. Interesting. Uh, so we just kind of, you know, we just kind of were in that place where, well, he's interested and he saw it and now he has feedback and you know, he's the boss ultimately. Yeah. Right? So was it, uh, was it challenging to get something as fresh as Republic commando through the system at LucasArts? It was, we were, you know, the, and I wasn't on the project the whole time. I was on Full Throttle 2 for a period of time. Oh, weird. That, you know, fell apart. But um, initially, they, I mean, this was one thing that Darren Stinnett, who was originally the project lead and then ultimately the executive producer uh, for Republic Commando, and he had been my Starfighter boss and Jedi Starfighter boss. He did, he did Outlaws and Dark Forces. So Darren, Darren's been in the industry or was in the industry a long time. He's doing something else now. Um, but his his genius was always trying to isolate the team from the rest of the building. When I got to LucasArts, I was originally kind of in the thick of it in the you know this hallway that was close to everybody, like right around the corner from the president's office. And he took us and he put us in a corner of the building that had been completely unoccupied. Um, this was a time when LucasArts was really trying to grow, and I think it went from you know 75 to 100 developers to over 350 in a short span, like no more than a couple of years, which. Yeah, has its own things. But for Republic Commando, he took the, that same team and put them in an office. And it was a small team figuring out how to make this game with the Unreal Engine, which was a whole new thing. And he put them in this isolated spot in what was called the mezzanine, which you had to go. You, you, you had to have a key card to get to because it was 
it was not really part of our space at all, but we had gotten that space and it was kind of sort of associated with Lucas Learning, which was in the same building with us. Anyway, he, he basically isolated everybody over into there and doing things like that made him able to stay under the radar long enough that he could get a lot of good work done. But then when he was really ready to ramp up and be in full production, he would be the Star Wars game and he, you know, he could kind of demand what he needed resource wise, you know, people wise artists and animators. Oh, I need to have this animator because this animator is really good at that or this programmer, this programmer. And so he became, he, he kind of germinated and kept out of, you know, the sunlight and then would kind of like, okay, now I need a lot of space and you need to, you know, fill it in with these people and, and, and get it done. And yeah. uh, that's just his strategy. Yeah. How, uh, how deep in development did the sequel get to the, was it the, Imperial Commando? Isn't that, uh, Oh, right. So there were not no, nowhere. I mean, there nowhere. were basically ideas, um, you know, because the company rebooted itself between us finishing the game and it coming out. So the last uh, four months, five months of that project were brutal because as as we hit various milestones, large parts of the team, you know, different parts of the team would just be laid off um, as we were finishing the game. So it was, mm. it was kind of a brutal, a brutal period. Um, and then I left on December 23rd or whatever, right before Christmas, uh, was my last day. And, uh, you know, people were scratching around design ideas, but the company had been, you know, so significantly turned over at that point. There was no, I mean, I don't think Jim Ward who became the president really had any belief in the title. Um, I had heard reports that he, he spoke at a, you know, all company meeting. It was like, wow, you know, Republic Commandos sold, yada 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 units whatever it was and people and he was su genuinely surprised because it had really no advertising um and had a total sleeper hit kind of quality that he just didn't get and didn't expect i mean he was another person who was not really a gamer all that much we played some some madden or something like that but yeah. he he didn't play the star wars games so oh well so then interesting period yeah, I would imagine. So then that December 23rd, you packed up and went out to Maryland then for Fallout 3? That's right. I didn't join uh, up with Bethesda right away. Um, I spent a year with Day One Studios. Um, they were about an hour away from where my kids uh, are. Okay. And, you know, there was some personal stuff in my life. I was getting separated and divorced and stuff like that. So I didn't. I just didn't want to do that every day. Drive right, right. Two hours. Um, so instead, I went and did some consulting um, I worked a little bit on the Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Online. Oh, um, weird. Okay. Other stuff, and uh, yes, yeah, so it was Star Trek Online when it was with Perpetual. So I did that for I don't know a year. I, I consulted on a couple things here and there, uh, and then I went to Bethesda. When I originally interviewed with Bethesda um, towards the end of 2004, they were basically heading into their Oblivion crunch, and having just come off my Republic Mano crunch, I just said to them, "Look." I am so fried right now. <laughs> I need to go to a, you know, I need to go somewhere where I'm not going to immediately go into another year of crunch. And trying anymore. to get caught up on everything with oblivion. Like, okay, how do I hit the ground running at the home stretch here? Yeah. Yeah. So instead I ended up coming in more towards the very end of fallout three. I mean, I, I started there in June or July and it shipped in whatever, October, November. Yeah. And, uh, I spent a lot of time that at the end of that project, just, you know, the, I was hired as a lead, but nobody needed leadership at that point in the project. It's just like, let's get this thing done. So I took just just dove in and, and, and helped improve performance and stability. Um, and then that became a big focus of what we did uh, moving forward for, for Skyrim as well. What is it like uh, the first time you hear Elder Scrolls V and Skyrim? While you're working on Fallout 3, it's just like, well, everyone knows. I mean, next we're going to do Elder Scrolls V. But then at some point, is there a group meeting where it's like, by the way, it's called Skyrim, Skyrim, Skyrim. Uh, you know, I don't... It's hard for me to remember how that happened. I mean, so I was not a huge... Um, I've played RPGs my whole, you know, gaming life. But I I think I had not... I had, hadn't played much of Morrowind. Okay. Uh, I'd seen it. I mean, I definitely played it just in preparation to interview you know, so before I went there, um, I played Oblivion quite quite a lot, uh, actually. Somebody, had, you know, a friend of mine from LucasArts, uh, Reed Knight, had had recommended it, and said, you know, you really gotta, you know, give this a go. And I was like, I don't know, Morrowind was kind of a lot of books that you're supposed to read or something. <laughs> I don't know what the heck's going on with that thing. Um, and there's not a lot of direction, right? And and um, he said, no, no, Oblivion is a much more polished 
uh, version of what they're trying to do and you should give it a try. So I did. I, and I got really into it. I feel I finished, you know, big like thieves guild quest and the big like mage line and the fighter. There's maybe a fighter's guild quest line, I think in the main story. Right. So I did basically four of the five big quests. Sure. And, um, so I, I, I spent a lot of hours on that thing. And in fact, it was one of the things Todd asked me, well, you know, how much have you played of oblivion? When we when he interviewed me and I was like, well, I did this quest and this quest and he's like, hey, he's like oh, okay, you've done you played quite a lot of the game, but for me, I didn't have this long history with the Elder Scrolls. You know, I hadn't, you know, I had only scratched the surface with Morrowind at all. Um, I had played a lot of Oblivion, but it didn't carry a lot of. So Skyrim didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know it was the land of the North and all that stuff. Um, I think the thing that really connected with me, you know, and I, I think he talked about this at Dice after it came out was that he when they found the sort of key image. Um, of what it was going to be like, what what this thing would feel like, and what the sort of aesthetic was meant to be, grandly speaking, was, you know, it's sort of Conan in the snow. You know, that actually kind of connected with me, like, oh, okay, I get what we're making now. You know, we're making that kind of thing, that kind of high fantasy, you know. It wasn't the polished kind of imperial area. It was this, you know, far-flung province or whatever, and having that image, you know, which kind of morphed into the, the Elder Scrolls Dragonborn guy that you see in all the key art. Yeah. Um, you know, that was the thing where it's like, oh, OK. I mean, the whole team kind of got around that and we're like, oh, OK, now now we know. I mean, that now we know what we're making. And it's so uh, crazy how just one thing can lock it in for so many people. It's like, it oh, really, no, Conan really in the does, snow. Yeah. OK, got it. Let's right. go ahead and make a game now. Yeah. What uh, what doesn't the outside world know or appreciate about the internal workings of Bethesda Game Studios? What do they know? What or... don't they know? Oh, what what should we know? What should we appreciate more about the way that place works and how they're able to crank out those games? I, you know, I this kind of came up recently. Somebody was asking me. I was interviewed about um, some archaeological stuff that somebody had done to dig up the Civil War remnants that were in the you know packaged data that that shipped with the game. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean that. Originally, our original thoughts were there were a lot of systems that were a lot deeper in the game, and ultimately we didn't find them fun, and so we removed them. And people will say, well, you can tell that the original vision for the game was this. And we said, no, no, no. I mean, this is, I think, the thing that people don't understand about Bethesda games. There's not, there's not one vision. You know, it's, it's not like we write it all out and it's this thing. It's, um, it's, it's a million things, and we'll pick the things that are are really strong, and we'll kind of shine a light on those. You know, the the dragons were not going to be as big a deal as they as they ended up being. Um, they they just were so successful. You know, Dave Dave D'Angelo, who's who's a programmer there, um, he kind of went off on his own and worked with an animator and with the modeler, which is Jonah Loeb, who's also ex uh, ex Bethesda, and they made this thing really feel like no dragon had felt before in a video game, at least as far as we felt. Um, and that was so successful that it was like, okay, well, that's definitely more of a thing now. This we'll is a dragon build, game now. Yeah. Exactly. We'll build a lot more around that than we had originally intended. And, you know, so I, I think a lot of the sort of random dragon encounters you, you'll you have were not a thing. And that kind of pulled stuff along with it. You know, the dragon priests became more of a thing. And that kind of, all that stuff sort of pushes the Civil War to the background a little bit. Um, as a result and the civil war stuff was just less successful. And so we just kind of were like, okay, well it's nice flavor. Um, but building a lot of systems around it doesn't feel like it's going to have the payoff. And, and so we just kind of like, okay, well, you know, the original vision is ship a great game with lots of things for people to do and let them kind of experience and have it be a mirror to them, their own selves you know, in terms of what they, they want to be or experience in a game and not, it has to have this and it has to have that. You know, I think other games do that more. They have one thing that they're going for. And I think that that's a very different thing about the sort of Bethesda approach. Get it, it in, see if it's fun. If it's fun, we'll pay off on it. And if it's not fun, we'll just kind of, you know, background it a little bit more. And the team so. just has the time and the support to like, hey, let's just make a soup for a while and see what really pops. Yeah, exactly. And and it's, it's a team that's worked together for years. I mean, there's people yeah. who are, you know, decades veterans there. And, you know, I, I would say the bulk of the team has worked together for 10 years at least. And, and that's pretty unusual in the games industry as well. So they're, they're just really good at, Oh, you need this. Let me give you that. And, and people kind of push what they want to push, you know, and, and change things that feel 
um, that they really want to kind of take ownership and push forward. So it's, it's very individually driven that way, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then Todd uh, and others kind of at the top are evaluating the game constantly and making decisions about where more effort should be put in. So what do you count? Or what do you, I don't know. Why do you think that people stick around there for so long? Is it just because it's kind of a remote studio or do you think it has just a healthy culture or it's like people there just realize you're not going to get a more hardcore game design experience than right. just sticking with Bethesda? I think it's all of those things. I mean, it does. I mean, certainly for people who've been there a long time, I think it's very much a, a family, you know, is for, for them. I mean, I came along, you know, I was Johnny come lately, right? I mean, they had already had success with, with Oblivion and they were, you know, about to ship Fallout 3. And it's, you know, a lot of people have just been there and worked together for a long time. I mean, I, I do think that the sort of remoteness um, doesn't help. Uh, you know, I mean, it helps at least keep people there, I should say. Yeah. People, don't, people don't have a lot of places immediately to go necessarily. Um, but, you know, there's, it's not impossible to move around a little bit. Uh, but I do think that if you if you started there and you've been there for a while and you're starting to think about a family, well, now you are kind of rooted here and you want to, you know, spend your time, you know, and spend a decade or more at one place. And uh, they're very lucky to to have that opportunity, to be honest, in, in this industry. Yeah. Um, the kind of success the games have had have really made that a possibility. And that's really wonderful. So, As someone who reads every comment on our YouTube channel for Game Informer, I think oh. you'd be shocked I'm to know... It's kind of fun. I mean, it's it's the lowest low of the internet, but also it's always fun to see people going back to old videos, and especially like our Skyrim cover story stuff. Uh, it is shocking how many people just worship at worship Todd Howard. It is constant comments on these old tour videos we did of the studio saying like, oh, God, Howard, I would just want to lick that guy's shoes. Just let me touch him. What do you think that is? Well, he, he's, a, he, he's just such a gamer i mean he you know he really is i i think that that is fundamentally the the core strength of the studio is that todd just has a great eye and he knows what he knows what feels good i mean he's he's got taste right he knows you know what's going to connect with the audience because it connects with him it's not it's not calculated in any way it's you know when what you see is what you get with todd howard you know he's a geek who loves games and i think that that comes through. I mean, certainly he's a, he's a pretty private person. He doesn't do a ton of interviews. They usually just are around when the games come out. So he's not out there every year flogging something and, and, you know, he doesn't even necessarily show up on the E3 stage every year. It's only, I have this thing that we've been working on and let's show you. Yeah. And other than that, he's kind of out of the public eye. And I think that that's, you know, that's also helps in the sense that when he is talking to the public, he knows what we have. I mean, he knows, or, what they have, I should say. Um, he knows what the game is now and what they're focusing on. And there's not a lot of empty promises. And his excitement about the things he's excited about definitely comes through. I mean, he is legitimately, every time he shows, you know, like a dragon shout or something like that through the Skyrim stuff, he's literally excited about it. I mean, he like can't wait to show you because it's so cool to him, the things that we've been, you know, the team was able to pull off. And I think that just shows through and that, that makes him very likable and yeah. very relatable from that standpoint. It's interesting. I mean, he's, he's it's like a lot of the audience. Yeah, the longer you work with him, the more you just appreciate that geek passion as the, yeah. as the core component there and the core bit of genius, I guess. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting. Even like uh, on the, we didn't, went on a Dark Souls 3 cover story trip, and that was the main takeaway from interacting with Miyazaki as much uh, at From Software. is like, oh, he's just a big old geek. I yeah. get it now. Okay, this makes right. much more right. sense. That's That's the main component here. Yeah. Yeah. Another good example for sure. I mean, that guy has a vision and he's really into what he he does and the product shows it. And, you know, you can feel you can feel that in the games, you know. Yeah, so. definitely. Uh, what do you think about the switch port of Skyrim as someone uh, who knows that code? It. Well, yeah, I haven't haven't played it. I have no idea. Yeah, um, I won't probably play it. I have played the beginning of Skyrim so many hundreds of times. Um, I can't. Like I, I got Fallout 4 when it came out. You know, I have a I have a code that got me the got me the game, and uh, I started playing it, and I was like, "Yep, can't do it." <laughs> really? I've played this, I've played this so much, uh, even in its early form. I, I left at the very end of pre-production, but that introductory part and all the way down through into I guess Conquered, um, all of that was was stuff we were working on, you know, two years before it shipped. Yeah, and I just. I have a hard time playing my games anyway because I see a lot of flaws when I play. I see, 
I see my experience of making the game in the game. So, oh, this is a thing that didn't quite pay off like we would have liked, or that's a that's a bug. My, many people would not even know that's a bug, but it's a bug, you know. And I have a very hard time looking at that. And it took me ten years, I think, to be able to go back to Republic Commando and play that. Yeah, and you um, live streamed it, right? Uh, I did. I put it on YouTube, and ultimately Columbia or Sony or somebody complained that I was using parts of John Williams' music for like 10 seconds in the middle of that, and I just took it down because I'm like, I just don't have the energy to fight this kind of crap. Um, but uh, it was fun to do. I still have the video somewhere on a hard drive downstairs, so it's it's not a not a problem. I could probably put it up again and try to bleep it out. I don't, I don't know what the heck they would want. But, um, but it was uh, it was very hard to do that, and even then... I mean, at that point, I was sort of had enough distance to be beyond any issues. But in the, you know, in the moments after, you know, it's only been, you know, I say this and now I feel silly, but it's only been six years <laughs> since Cairo came out. You know, it's I, all fresh. It's, it's yeah, it's like it's yesterday, man. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's really hard for me to separate that from, you know, the pure play experience as much as I loved playing it while it was in development. You know, I played. I want to say 500 hours of Skyrim um, in that last, you know, year before it came out. Oh man! So I've played a lot of Skyrim, and I've seen just about everything in the game. But it's very hard for me to go back and play um, anything I've worked on before. There's just again. so few people in the world who know what's going on under the hood uh, in like Skyrim specifically. Is that just wild to play and be like, I know why that bug's happening. I know why that bug's happening. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty weird. It's pretty weird generally, I think, with things that you that you make or play. You know, game, this is one of the things they say about creative work, right? Is it's never finished. It's just abandoned. And you just try to abandon it at the right time. And uh, when it's as, as full as it's going to be, you know, you can't overdraft something, right? I mean, there's, you know, in writing, for example, and you probably know this, you write and things like that. So you can you can re-edit a draft long enough until it becomes flat and all the energy is now gone from the writing because you've tried to sand down all the edges and make it perfect. And in doing so, you lose some vitality. And some of that vitality is just because the moment has changed, right? The, the environment in which you're going to release this product or whatever has changed. If you spent five years after Skyrim polishing Skyrim to make it completely bug-free or whatever, um, it would lose a ton. I mean, it just I don't think it would work at you know, in the same way that it did when it released, right? And um, I think finding those moments for any creative thing is a, is a huge deal. It certainly loses some social media buzz with people posting the hilarious <laughs> glitches of all time. I mean, that's just well, part of the yeah, charm. Yeah, sure, that's, that's true. I love that. <laughs> I love, I mean, some of them certainly, you know, you know about, it. like the giant smashing the ground and having all this huge amount of physics force and like throwing you way up in the air. That's awesome. What, why would you change that? I mean, it's so great. I mean, that's, I mean, that stuff's fun, what, you know. Or what happens when you put a thousand cheese wheels and let them roll down a hill? Like, I don't know, but you know what? I bet it's going to be fun. <laughs> if you've got a computer that can do it, by all means, you know, the game's not going to stop you. Um, and yeah, so that stuff's fun for us. But if the team grabbed onto that during development, they'd be like, cheese wheels. That's going to be a main <laughs> focus of Skyrim. This is where the fun is, you guys. You know, one of the things is Adam Adamowicz, uh, RIP, he was the, he was the um, concept artist for Fallout 3. And um, I think maybe for Oblivion, it's certainly before my time, and then certainly for Skyrim, and even some of his stuff, I think, goes into Fallout 4. Um, he he was created, a concept artist, had been there a long time, and uh, died during the course of, I believe, Skyrim's development. And um, anyway, there was a period where he basically, with, I um, um, can't remember Ray's last name, but with, the, with another concept artist, just like one week, or like, we're working on meat this week. We're just working on meat. Meat's going to be important, Todd. And Todd's like, what are you doing? And, you know, they're drawing, you know, mammoth snouts and, you know, different kinds of steaks and I guess the, the salmon in different forms. And uh, like, no, no, it's all meat. This week it's meat. It's all about meat, Todd. You'll, believe me, you'll be happy. You'll be happy with the meat. And Todd's just like, okay, you guys, you guys know what you're doing. You know, I'm not going to complain. This is just kind of the magic of how it gets there, I guess. Um, and so that game has a lot of meat. <laughs> really good looking meat for a reason good looking meat <laughs> so what's it like to make the transition uh i guess to go back to consulting then and eventually find your way to fulbright with tacoma um it's been really nice i mean i at the at the uh end of a couple of years working on fallout 4 where i was the overall lead programmer not just of a subgroup of programming but all of the programmers um 
I was I was exhausted and and frankly just kind of burnt out and have been doing the same thing, you know, sort of leading and managing teams for I don't know, ten years or something like that at that point. And I was just kind of done. I just I was just fried. I was so fried. I can look back on it now and go, oh yeah, that is a picture of a burned out man, um, a, a a husk. And uh, and so I just took some time off. I helped a friend ship a thing. Um, I got to teach uh, at Wabash College. Cool. Um, I don't know if you know Michael Abbott. He's a uh, brainy gamer. Um, oh, wait. He used, to, he used to have a podcast and a blog. Yeah, yeah, and he, yeah. That was kind of the thing in the, the sort of mid to late aughts was the, the brainy gamer and the, the, what we called the brainy sphere, which was all the bloggers who kind of tied in with Michael. Um, anyway, so I've kept in touch with Michael, and we taught a class together uh, at, his, at the college where he was a professor um, in game design and development. That was really fun. And uh, so I just kind of had opportunities to kind of pick and choose. And I was lucky in that, you know, Skyrim did very well. Fallout 3 did very well. Um, I was, you know, I was very much loved by Bethesda. And so I felt I, I had the financial freedom. And I've also kept my cost of living down. I had the freedom to take some time and just chill for a while and figure out what I wanted to do next. You know, so there was a lot of reading and a lot of movies and a lot of games and uh and yeah some opportunities that i i wouldn't have had otherwise yeah. um ultimately and... actually through the brainy sphere i met uh i met steve uh gainer because he was one of those guys who was blogging back in you know 2007 or whatever yeah and uh had a lot of respect certainly for gone home i remember i sent them a handwritten letter uh in the mail like people used to do in the 1800s um uh, after the game came out and explained like how I felt about the game and what it, you know, what it brought out in me. And it's very gone home how, of you to do. Yeah. yeah how, I, how I thought it worked and, uh, and why I thought it worked and, and just was very positive on the thing. So it was, you know, we had kind of a connection there and I had actually talked to them about coming on to work on what would become Tacoma. Um, but that offered it to teach and be an artist in residence or whatever for, for a semester was kind of a unique situation. It's not the sort of thing that I felt like was going to ever come up again. And I just said, you know what, Steve, I love you guys, and I can't wait to see what you're going to play, uh, what you're going to build, rather, and I'll play it. But I need to, I need to do this thing because I'll never get a chance to do this thing again. So um, I went and did that instead, and that was that was great. Yeah. Um, and then you eventually and then, came back around and helped finish it off. Yeah, and then I then I came back around. And they had um, another programmer who was going through some. Uh, some things of his own that he needed to deal with. And so he, he had to leave the project. Um, and that was, I guess, last September is when I came on, something like that. And, uh, and just dove in and you know, started trying to make the game perform better, you know, stream in various parts of the environment. There's lots of, lots of other things. But those are kind of the big ones that, uh, that I certainly was responsible for uh, out of the gate. And so it seemed like from the outside world, at least at some point, I think it was like in a giant bomb interview, Steve Gaynor talked about Tacoma 2.0 or kind of like a, a reboot. Was that a soft thing? Or when you came on board, was there kind of like a concrete, like let's reset some things, let's rebuild this space station? Oh, no, it's all that, laid out? that happened probably a year before I got there. Okay. So I, I think, I mean, you can remember sort of the original concept uh, art that they showed in E3, I don't know, 2014, 15, something like that was of a very art deco, brassy kind of environment. Yeah. And I think all of the station had been um, maybe zero G at that point. Sounds right. Yeah. Right. And and so that was kind of where they started. And um, I think that's what they rebooted. And uh, and I wasn't I definitely wasn't there for any of that. A, a lot of the game. So what we had of the game was sort of the initial experience Um not the first uh, opening kind of cutscene, but the the first interactive bits. You go and you get the hardware, and you you go down into um, personnel, admin, and and ops or whatever it's called down there. And uh, all of that was working and fairly built out um, when I when I came on. I mean, there was more content to be added, but the main scenes were there. All the play was there. He actually had me play that before I started, you know, in, in August, I think, of last year. So that was all there. And what they were building out was um, the other two, you know, we call them wings, but the other the other two transfers, uh, those two areas. And, uh, and that was really being built out. And a lot of the story was being worked still. They had a general idea of the path, but actually integrating in all the animation. 
Um, I mean, Noel Welly did the animation, and it's fantastic in the game. Um, it, it it really carries things through. And then Nina Freeman and, and Tynan Wales did all this sort of design stuff with Steve, and then Carla does all this sort of 2D art and artifacts. Yeah. And the two of them do the story. Um, Hannah Bone was a programmer who was originally intern, but she did most of the gameplay programming, certainly all the interaction with the animation and things like that. I mean, the team is really good, <laughs> um, and uh, and I, uh, it was so great to come in and just have a team of people who knew what they were going to do and were executing on it, yeah. and just being able to, like, day by day support and make that better in any way that, that I could. You know, whether that was, it would be great if we could do this thing tools-wise, I mean, just to be able to do a thing more quickly or looking at the things that were going to lead to, you know, the performance being where, where it would be. And so launching, um, launching the game this week, you don't look like a husk of a man. So overall, was it no. just <laughs> night and day as far as stress goes That's compared because to... because I shaved today, Ben. Ah, uh, you're looking very good. Looking very good. Uh, no, I actually had to put in my phone today, shave. Uh, <laughs> I probably would not have thought of it otherwise. Um, I, uh, I'm pretty tired. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, uh, I was up very late last night. I was up very early this morning when I'm in crunch, um, you know, and this, there was crunch, uh, you know, because there was a lot to, a lot of performance to squeeze out, um, a lot of issues to kind of work out. And of course, whenever you're dealing with a, a license holder, um, you, you have to go through their certification process. That's its own, you know, thing to do. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stress in all of that. Um, I'm really looking forward tomorrow to flying out to Portland and spending uh, the weekend with the team. Oh, it's gonna be nice. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a little little party and you know and celebrate uh, the thing coming out, and then we'll look at what are the odd edge cases that people are running into that we didn't have coverage to test, or you know, just the ability to when you when you put something out on a console, basically every console is the same. Put something out on the PC, basically every PC is different. So. Yeah. You have uh, you have all <laughs> you know people who are like, well, I use this software to map my input from the PlayStation controller, and that's not working. And I'm like, oh my god, man. <laughs> so I mean, is it too easy just to say that you started out in this endeavor being like, oh, it'd be nice to work on a little game, something a little bit more stress free, and then it ramped up, and it's like, oh no, it turns out every game project is stressful. Yeah, no, I never thought it would be stress free. Yeah. Um, I think that. And, and this goes back to my Starfighter experience, which is before this, I would say pretty much my smallest team. Um, that was like 20, 25 people or something like that in the core. But, uh, you know, it's not so much this. The, the thing that I really benefit from and really love about a small team is, first of all, I can name everybody on the team. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's really great. Oh, I missed Kate, the 3D artist um, who, who did all the Gone Home 3D art as well. So uh, she's wonderful. And she's on the East Coast with me, so we're often on Slack at the same time in the morning. Um, but uh, hi, Kate. Uh, anyway, the um, the great thing is you can see yourself on the screen when the game comes out. You can see the things that you did. You had a direct input impact on, on the game. And, I mean, as much as I love Skyrim, um, part of my frustration at that point in my career was I'm at a point in my career where when I – I might tell a person to go do a thing, <laughs> but I'm not actually doing that thing that makes it into the screen. You know, I told, uh, I, I told my physics programmer and my animation programmer, we're going to do this thing where we pair up the animations, you know, like God of War or something like that. And I don't know what we're going to use it for, but we need to have that technology. We should just build it. Here's, here's a design. This is what you would do. Go build it. And Todd came over and like, you got these guys doing this thing. Why are you doing this thing? And I was like, Todd, like you, I mean, you know, God of War, they do all the door opening stuff with that. And he's like, Oh, right. Okay. I got it. You know? And so I sort of, I see myself at one remove you yeah. know, from that, you know, I sort of, I, I go and say, okay, I, you know, I, I, I told a person to do that thing, <laughs> you know, that results in all those kill moves and all that stuff, but I wasn't day to day involved. And I don't really take a huge amount of pride in that. I take a pride in the overall product. And mostly for me, the product I made making Skyrim was these, you know, seven or eight programmers. You know, that's my product. These these people started here. They ended here. They're a tight-knit group. They're really good at what they do. And now they can do more in the next game. Whereas you know, Tacoma, yeah. Whereas yeah. Tacoma, you look at it, it's like... I can, I can go in and say, oh, the load time at the beginning is not three and a half minutes. 
I did that. You know, <laughs> I can go down these, we go down these transfer shafts and they take 20 seconds or whatever. I did that. Um, you know, whatever, wherever the number is you know, yeah. today, but you know, it's, it's, you know, when those things used to take forever. And in fact, I found a thing between review copies going out and, you know, and, uh, and the final game, you know, it's like I cut another 25 seconds off of that. And that directly impacts people's play experience. And I mean, there's other things like stuff that I did for that, like the sunlight, but mostly the, the performance of the thing is, is me. And you know, that, that's a tangible thing that you can look at and see and feel. And I mean, you get a buzz out of it. with those sorts of things on Skyrim, but I can't, I can't at any point in the game say, Oh, this is this much faster. Cause I did a thing. So what do you, what, what's it like weighing those different things in your mind then in regards to your future? Do you get such a buzz out of having such a tangible impact that you want to see in a smaller team? Or is it like, well, I'm living in this house because of Skyrim. Maybe it'd be nice to go back to a larger team. <laughs> um, I'm not living in this house because of Skyrim. I'm living in this house because of me. Uh, there we so go. maybe LucasArts, I guess. But um, I, uh, no, I, I mean, I am talking with, I'm talking with Fulbright about what they might do next. I mean, that's so not on anybody's mind yet. So yeah. um, that's not a thing. Uh, to think about too much, but you know, we, we should at least talk and see if there's a further relationship we want to pursue. I love them all. I think they're terrific people and you know, it's great working with them. So it's, it's a huge possibility. And I have, I have had other people who are running small things or are about to start small things where I'm like, Oh wow, that does sound really interesting. And being on the ground floor of that might be really cool. So I am, I am looking mostly at smaller, smaller sorts of things, yeah. um, because of that direct impact. And, I'm not closing the door on going back and managing a big team someday. Uh, I mean, that could even grow out of some of these things. So it's not like it's going to go away. I'm, you know, we've been talking for whatever, an hour, and I'm very comfortable talking and working with people. That's not an engineering thing normally. Um, so I just kind of naturally am very comfortable interfacing with creative people. Um, and so I want to do that, and I want to, regardless of where I end up, for me, that's a huge part of the equation is do I get to talk with smart, creative people every day? And, you know, like I said, programmers are all smart, creative people. They're just smart, and creative in kind of this this way, you know, and I like talking with the whole. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I mean, the, the art department, the animation department uh, and the design department love me at Bethesda because. I could talk their language. I would walk over and like to have a problem. You know, we put in a new scripting language, for example. And for Skyrim, we took out the old one, put in a new one. We tried to make it as close as possible in some ways, the other one, but for performance and other reasons, it had to be pretty different. And I said, look, I know this is a big challenge. It's a big change. We're changing also the animation system and things like that on you. Like a lot is changing. Um, but I will literally come to your desk and sit with you and work through problems that you have whenever you have them. Um, because I want this to succeed. And I know that it might take my hand on the till to make that succeed. And so is Jeff, you know, Jeff Lundin, who was the, the guy who actually made that system. He will also come to your desk. Um, he wrote all the documentation that ended up being, you know, what shipped when we, when they, um, they put out the creation kit or whatever, you know, there was a ton of scripting system documentation because he had kept all that current and made sure it was up to date so that we could support the designers. Yeah. And it was the same with, you know, different people on team for different things that they were looking to do. So, yeah, for sure. Well, hey, congratulations on shipping Tacoma and uh, keep Thanks it good so work. Much. Man. I hope everybody plays it. It's, it's such a lovely game. There are so many great human moments in it. I really, there are parts of the game that every time I see them, um, and I haven't gotten tired of playing the game yet, despite you know it is not a long game. Um, but there are some great, just touching human moments that I love about it. You know, there's great vocal performances. Uh, the story is really terrific, but the details and, and everything that the team has filled out the world with are just lovely to me. And I just feel so proud to, to have had a chance to work with them. So, yeah, it's a personal project for you. It feels like, and it's nice that it's such a, a personal game or an intimate game when you're playing it, that the characters in the game are also so yeah. relatable on a small scale. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love sure. it. I cool. love it. Well, thanks again for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll talk to you sometime. Sounds good. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody.
Right. Then I just nail it. Then I actually do the the cool loop to loop. Uh-huh. Toss it over my shoulder like a continental soldier, as they say, Dan Tech. I've never, I've never I've never heard that. <laughs> no, for real. Never heard about somebody tossing something like over a the soldier, soldier, like a continental soldier. I've never heard that. It's thing. a rhyme from like 1783. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm out of the loop. Oh, damn. <laughs> so I heard it. I heard that. Do your ears hang low? Do, Do they, they wobble to and fro? Right. Can, can you, you tie, tie them in a knot? Can, can you tie them in a bow? Except. Can you, Throw them over your soldier, shoulder like a continental soldier. Except. I don't know what that means. The more I, I think about either. that, though, I heard it as your ears, but I don't think it's ears. I think it's about your, I think it's a Wang song. What? Wait a minute. Cisco's I'm, I'm Wang song? I'm completely lost now. You really? But I, it was like on Lamb Trap and crap. I, I think <laughs> that they replaced, I think it was originally a song. I mean, think about it. Like. Oh, I bet it's a. Hang low, does it wobble too? I bet it was a ball song. Can you tie it in a knot? Can you tie it in a bow? That was the playground parody that I was familiar with growing up. <laughs> yeah. I never connected Can that. Can you throw it so, over your shoulder like a continental? <laughs> I mean, like, whoop, that w- makes way more <laughs> sense than your ears. So that you think it, it started a as like a, a military so, that- jingle of people talking about their gonads, and then they're like, we have to babify this up because we need that sweet <laughs> shoulder soldier <laughs> rhyme. Yeah, to be fair, our a, kids a, lot of, a lot of like rhymes and stuff were, you know sanitized for general use. Yeah. So I mean, think right. about that ring around the rosy. Right. I was too. about to yeah. go to that. Yeah, that's, that's true. That one's about boobs. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Venereal disease. <laughs> 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 uh.